Good evening. Welcome to our Pullman City Council meeting. This is a special meeting. That's why we're meeting at six o'clock in the evening. And this is part two tonight of a budget presentations that you'll have a chance to see. And our council will have a chance to go through as well. So first of all, uh, Dee, would you please call roll? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Johnson. Here. Council Member Chapman. Here. Council Member McCall. Here. Council Member Parks. Here. Council Member Records. Council Member Sorensen. Finally here. <laughs> Council Member Weller. Present. Council Member Wright. Here. Under announcements tonight, uh, the city is doing its leaf pickup in between the icing and snow plowing right now. Mother Nature just didn't cooperate very well with our leaf pickup schedule. So this week on Sunnyside Hill, November 13th to the 16th, and the 17th on Pioneer Hill, then Military Hill and College Hill. Just go to Pullman-WA.gov on the homepage and you'll see the leaf pickup schedule. It's right down there on the bottom on the homepage. Very well presented for everyone. I wanna thank uh, Police Chief Gary Jenkins and uh, WSU Police Chief Bill Gardner for reimagining public safety, a virtual summit that we had last night. A number of you that are on here tonight uh, were on that uh, Summit. We also want to thank the Pullman Police Advisory Committee for hosting that. It was a good presentation, had a chance to talk about a lot of the issues. And again, thank you, Gary, for being so proactive and doing that uh, presentation. We appreciate it. Pullman Regional Hospital wants you to know that they are not at capacity. It's quite a headline Friday in the Daily News that said COVID capacity. Some people misinterpreted that at capacity. In October, Pullman Regional was running close, but not far in no, no, so far in November. They have not come close to capacity. Pullman Regional Hospital. Yes, elective surgeries are taking place. All the people who need a hospital, Pullman Regional is there for you. All services are available. I want to thank Palouse Medical and specifically Dr. Stephanie Fosbach for helping us get test results back quicker for our first responders. We have a COVID leadership meeting about every other week, and I mentioned that, that some of our police officers and firefighters were exposed, went for tests, and it was taking 24 to 36 hours to get back the results. After the meeting, Dr. Fosbach got on the fast track. Results are now back in a couple of hours, and Dr. Ed Schweitzer was at that meeting as well. He offered a quick test they're using at SEL for our first responders. So now our first responders can get the results back quicker and get back on shift and make sure that if they were exposed, they can be treated the right way. This is the last week that Troy Henderson will be serving as our director of Whitman County Public Health. He has taken a job with the Defense Department heading to Germany. This was in play, I just want you to know that, long before COVID-19 became an hourly conversation. His kids graduated from college, WSU, he's former military. He's been great for all of us. He's been an outstanding partner and friend. I've also served with him on the Community Action Center Board, the United Way Board, when one of the major concerns in the surveys for Whitman County was access to low-income dental services. We got the Smile Mobile going with the Washington Dental Association, and Troy was instrumental in getting us unified dental on Bishop, which accommodates Medi-Cal and low income, and really filled a need for the county. Troy will be missed. A couple of colleagues, Chris Skidmore and Ben Stone, will be filling in on an interim basis and both have been very helpful during this pandemic. So again, Troy, we appreciate all the work you've, you've done and helped us with. And now tonight, we now go to our budget presentations. You're gonna hear a lot from Kevin Gardas tonight. So we're gonna start off with him, then we're gonna hear from RJ Lott and Jen. So first of all, we have protective inspections, pages 60 to 61, and Kevin Gardas, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, I'll be presenting the public works budgets tonight, but I've also got um, our transit manager, Wayne Thompson, available to answer questions. He did a lot of the work on that budget, and Clayton Forsman and Art Garrow, who did work on the M&O budget. So between the four of us, we should be able to answer all your questions, hopefully. Um, as the mayor said, the budget begins on page 60. Uh, protective inspections is the only public works budget that is directly part of the general fund. 
As a general comment for all public works budgets, we have removed almost all of the minor equipment and capital items from the first quarter of 2021. Currently, this division consists of one senior building inspector and four building inspectors. Administrative personnel also provide support for the division. Salaries and benefits make up approximately 78% of the protective inspections budget in 2021 and 79% in 2022. In 2018, the city completed initial strategic planning work with three city departments, public works, finance, and parks. Initial recommendations that have been implemented uh, in public works so far include reestablishment of the city engineer position, giving the deputy public works director oversight over engineering and stormwater services, and moving government buildings to a reorganized parks and facilities department. In September of 2019, council authorized additional strategic planning work around a community development department plan and an MNO strategic plan, and I'll touch on those tonight. This latest effort looked at best practices of peer cities and proposed recommendations with the goal of enhancing customer service. This most recent strategic planning work completed earlier this year recommends converting our planning department into a community development department, which is the structure every peer city our consultant evaluated has. The most recent work includes recommendations to move protective inspections and economic development into community development department as well as to hire one additional planning staff person. Due to COVID um, and the associated revenue and budget implications, the most recent strategic planning recommendations are being scaled back in the 2021 and 2022 budget to just the following, um, converting the senior building inspector position to a building official, um, changing the title of the planning director to community development director, the latter being a no cost change, and any recommendations included by planning director Lott in his budget uh, presentation. By current city code, the public works director is the building official for Pullman. We are proposing that the senior building inspector become the building official, which is pretty common in other jurisdictions. Um, this would likely result in a slight bump in pay due to additional responsibility, but that would be more than offset by removing 10% of both my time and the deputy public works director's salaries and benefits from protective inspections. Once our new planning and community development director has had a chance to get his feet under him, we could then talk about moving forward on other recommendations. In the meantime, the, the public works department would continue to supervise the senior building inspector and building official. By incorporating these recommendations into the protective inspections 2021 budget, we project a savings of $23,508 in 2002. 2021. And I'll go ahead and show an org chart. So I'll share my screen right now to give you a visual. Can everyone see that? Is that on, up now? Okay, thank you. So um, at the top, that uh, upper half of the page is the existing org chart. So we've got a planning director, um, an assistant planner, and, a, and an aide. Um, and then we've got ad, admin help on the right side, so a total of 0.6 FTE right now. What we're proposing as part of this budget is that um, the planning director have a title change to community development director, uh, the, building, the senior building inspector become the building official, um, and then RJ will talk about uh, what he has in mind for the planning division on the left there. And then on the right side in the yellow color, um, that's just showing that additional FTEs that would go into the community development department that currently provide uh, admin support for the building department, the building inspectors. So assuming the building inspectors move into community development, then that associated admin would go along with them. So it really isn't new FTEs, it's just uh, shifting them around. So um, I think that's it. It's, it's a pretty simple proposal. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions about that, but I'll go ahead and finish the presentation on protective inspections, which won't take much longer. And then we can dive into questions on this budget. On page 61, you will find a budget breakdown. The proposed 2021 and 2022 budgets for protective inspections are 
$736,324 and $809,817 respectively, which is a decrease of $117,186 or 13.7% between 2020 and 2021 and an increase of 74,000 or 10% between 2021 and 2022. Both budgets come in less than the 2020 budget. In the 2021 budget year only, another cost saving uh, measure we're proposing is to uh, split one of our building inspectors time. So half of one building inspector would stay in protective inspections and the other half would provide construction inspector support for uh, the public works department on both private and city projects, um, essentially freeing us up to do to work on other things. And so that half of an FTE would come from the utility fund. So this is a way of, of trying to minimize expenses within protective inspections, recognizing that we still have a fairly busy workload. Um, building hasn't stopped, which is a good thing, um, but trying to manage the budget um, and the revenue shortfalls from COVID as best we can. Um, the remainder of the decrease in 2021 comes from a reduction in outside plan review, approximately 25,000, and that's for both 2021 and 2022, um, and removal of salary and benefits of the public works director and deputy pu public works director from this budget, which I mentioned earlier. We continue to work on implementation of online permitting software and hope to have that online in the first quarter of 2021. Minor equipment items include gas detectors, one large monitor for plan review and miscellaneous minor equipment. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic that 2021 will be a good year for building permit activity and two years out remains more of a, a wait and see as our crystal ball usually doesn't go out that far. Um, goals that this budget supports from the 2019 retreat are revise, enhance, and consider new and modernize and enforcement of city codes, reviewing staffing levels citywide and consider adding staff, parks, facilities, police, et cetera. And from the 2018 retreat, economic development. So I'd be happy to answer any questions on the protective inspections budget at this time. Since I can't see all the council members with a uh, split screen like this, uh, anyone yeah. want to ask any questions? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, okay. Nathan. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so, thank you so much, Kevin, for this. I just had a quick question, and it's it's nothing big. Um, so, 2020, uh, the overtime was 3,444 to date. I'm I'm guessing. Um, and that's, uh, an increase from 2019, given the pandemic, um, can you explain where, I mean, how that overtime went, uh, uh, where it went to? Sure. Um, it, it's not the 3,444 is a budget figure. It's not the actual number. So okay. we've actually probably spent less than a thousand dollars on overtime. And I would expect we won't spend any more than that. Um, okay. for the remainder of the year. So, and then gotcha. the 2019 column is the actual value there. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I got mixed up. Sorry. Thank you, Kevin. No worries. And we can, you can't say enough about our protective inspections. When uh, when we were, all building was stopped except for uh, public buildings and transportation buildings. And when we finally got the word that we could start doing some new construction, uh, not yet uh, to continue on with some things that already were in place. Protective inspections got out. Jeremy got out there so quick and got messages out to the contractors. I really got to hand it to him to try and bring in some kind of revenue. So really got to congratulate uh, Protective Inspection for a great job they did. Any other questions, of Kevin? Yeah, Kevin. sorry. One, one more. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, uh, you brought up a good uh, good point. Um, Kevin, I know I've used the protective inspections when I was first renting my uh, my house here, and it, it just night and day difference dealing with uh, my landlord and uh, making sure that the flooded basement, uh, you know, um, weird wiring, everything. Uh, you guys do an awesome job. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for bringing that up. And uh, thank you, Kevin and protective inspections. So, Mike, I see your hands up. 
Yeah, thank you. I wanted to touch on the overtime uh, question just a little bit more too. Uh, in 2020, uh, we brought on a fifth inspector to backfill Jeremy's position when he got promoted. And that is a position that we basically went all of 2019 without. So that also helped an awful lot on uh, the overtime as well as the um, inspectors getting together and working on some creative schedules that once they were able to go back out and inspect, they were able to get caught up very quickly and um, keep the ball rolling on construction in this town. So I just wanted to make sure the council was aware of that. Any other questions of protective inspection? If not, just before we take uh, on the uh, planning, uh, I was notified, just got notified that Dan Records did notify the city that he could not be here tonight. So do I hear a motion to excuse him? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Dan is excused. All right, with that, we now go to RJ Lott with the planning, pages 62 to 63. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, City Council. Thank you for having me this evening. I appreciate your time. So as the Mayor indicated, the Planning Department's budget uh, does begin on page 62 and continues to page 63. The Planning Department's, as you know, the primary responsibilities include performing regulatory functions of the Municipal Code and the Conference of Plan. This includes permit and development review and providing public information about development policies and regulations. In addition to these tasks, the Planning Department provides staff, staff support to the City Council, the Planning Commission, the Board of Adjustment, and the Historical Preservation Committee. The Planning Department's goals are to be efficient and effective while facilitate, facilitating progress that is in accordance with the City's Municipal Plan and Comprehensive Plan, as well as the Downtown Plan or any other studies. The implement, implementation of a public service oriented department will be derived from the improvement of communication and transparency with stakeholders, citizens, and developers. The key to land use planning really is the ability to connect with people. Improvement in these areas will likely lead to a direct rise in development within the city and subsequently an increase in revenue from construction sales tax, which has been so important during the year 2020. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, hopefully it's as successful as Kevin's. So on your screen, you should see a copy of my memo. Uh, for those that did not get a copy or for those tuning in from home, uh, you can take a look at this. So there are two major proposed changes uh, moving forward. The first one I'd like to highlight is the use of a hearing examiner to replace the current Board of Adjustment system. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the hearing examiner is traditionally a land use attorney, and as a result, that would likely reduce procedural errors, including due process, eliminate any issues with conflict of interest or appearance of fairness, minimize liability to land use, to land use decisions, and reduce issues with finding a quorum when hearing quasi-judicial applications. Other cities in Eastern Washington that utilize the hearing examiner include Spokane, Walla Walla, Wenatchee, Moses Lake, Yakima, and each of the Tri-Cities, Richland, Pasco, and Kenwick. The hearing examiner was included in the previously approved budgets, but due to the pandemic, the implementation was put on hold. A second item I'd like to highlight for this evening, and Kevin hit on this a little bit earlier, uh, is the addition of a full-time planning staffer. So what I'm proposing is the addition of a full-time entry-level employee beginning in quarter number three of 2021. Primarily the reasons for a entry level are one, uh, economics, wanting to be mindful of the city's budget, and two, entry level because this would closely align with the end of the academic school year. Uh, finding a entry level planning staffer right out of uh, college would be beneficial at, at this time. So in the uh, early summer would be that timeline. An additional planning staff member would assist in the customer service aspect of planning in collaboration with implementation of a new GIS system 
reduce turnaround times on applications submitted to City Hall, coordinate a new and formal pre-application meeting system, research and analyze emerging issues within the city, such as short-term rentals, electronic submissions, critical area regulations, and others. The need for another full-time planning employee was highlighted in the City of Pullman Community Development Plan completed earlier this year in April. So let me scroll down here in my, my memo and you can see, I'd like to draw your attention to the, the portion on table one that is labeled very similar sized communities. Uh, the most uh, comparable city that we have would probably be Wenatchee with very similar uh, population with about half the growth. Walla Walla is just about the same as well. Scrolling down here a little bit, Wenatchee has a planning manager and four planning staff, where if you recall seeing Kevin's organizational chart, we had myself as the planning director, one associate planner, and a planning aide at about 15 or so hours a week. Ellensburg also has four planners who direct reportly to a community development director, uh, and Ellensburg is smaller and growing. Uh, a little bit lower in this on this slide, I've included the city of Moses Lake with a population of just about 26,000. They have a community development director, a planning manager, and two associate planners. So the reason I'm showing you this data is to uh, include other cities here in Eastern Washington that have a smaller population, smaller growth rate, but yet have a more uh, robust planning department. So there really is a need to uh, hire an additional planning staff member, and that would help with providing a, a better service to the stakeholders of the city. Are there any questions at this time? Um, yeah. This is, this is Brandon. Okay, go ahead, Brandon. Uh, RJ, thank you. Um, I, I actually ha have thought for a while that the planning needed more additional staffing. Um, I, I appreciate you, you expressing that need. Um, and obviously you've thought through, um, how to make that work logistically with, um, you know, somebody who may fall into that, um, that position, uh, and what quarter that would be. So I appreciate that. Um, you, you've highlighted other cities, and I know Kevin did the same thing. Uh, I am all for um, putting things in line with what I think best practices are in other cities. Uh, they, of course, you, I think you would admit they don't always, um, they're not always comparable for a number of reasons, but, um, you know, GIS is something we're moving to that Kevin mentioned, electronic permitting is something we're moving to. So, uh, I guess, and from a planning um, aspect, I guess what I would like to ask is, um, in terms of impact fees with developers that um, that have projects in place. So when we're planning, uh, if if there is uh, some way to um, to look at a revenue uh, or a potential revenue um, that way, and I don't know if that that's even considered a revenue so much as it's. Um, that fee that would go directly to a specific service as defined by, um, you know, certain law. So, um, so what is your knowledge on RJ on, on the impact fees and maybe Mike can weigh into from a finance perspective. I know it's only for a specific, you know, set of things that, that they can go to, but I I'd love to, to not put in the next neighborhood and it immediately puts a strain on the infrastructure and, we can at least help offset some of that um, that cost, whether it's a, a, the next school or um, you know fire department or, or something like that. Yeah, great questions. Uh, uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, so impact fees would be something the city may want to take a closer look at, uh, so that you could, like as you said, the strain on current infrastructure uh, would not be overburdened because of a particular project. Uh, in terms of revenue, it may be. Uh, wise for staff to bring forward to council at some point, perhaps in 21, more information about how our fee schedule is, is put together. Uh, as you mentioned, not all cities are comparable apples to apples. However, our uh, fee schedule is 
quite low compared to other cities of Eastern Washington. Yeah, to, to tag on just really quick, um, since we're not a GMA county, having a um, menu of impact fees uh, is a little more problematic. It really needs to come through the SEPA process if we're going to um, charge some of these developers for the impact as they go. But certainly we can bring a full presentation back to council um, on all the options that are available so we can uh, make sure the infrastructure is not overtaxed. Laura, do you want to add a little bit? I saw you nodding your head when uh... I said I, he said exactly what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. One one request, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, wh whenever that that comes back uh, for for us to learn a little more, uh, and, and that process is really helpful. I know we've we've learned quite a bit through LTAC and other stuff uh, when those presentations are given. Uh, would you be able to, or or maybe Laura, explain the difference between the GMA and planning under the GMA, and I've heard those kind of terms. So when that presentation happens, um, maybe explain the difference between those. Um, that would be, I, I know, helpful for me. Um, and and I, I think I understand what you're saying about the SEPA process. So thank you. And I'll, I'll move forward on you know, a few irons in the fire on that. Okay, uh, Eileen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I I definitely support uh, support the additional staff member for uh, for planning. Um, I really am liking what I'm hearing, RJ. Uh, you've really uh, you know you've gained you've gained a remarkable sensitivity to the to the community in the short time that you've been there. Uh, the pre-application meeting is something that people have been asking and asking and asking for, and I think that'll uh, that'll really help us out in all sorts of ways. Um, coming up in the future here. So I, I'm very pleased to see this and uh, we're, we're turning a page here kind of in planning. Uh, we're going to, we're going to grow into the, go, grow into the recovery with all of this. And I think that's very important. Thank you so much for doing this. I love it. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nathan, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, RJ, great, uh, great presentation. Um, I, you know, especially in the midst of the pandemic, discussing uh, additional staff is kind of Challenging, I think, especially for uh, community members to hear. Um, however, I do understand that you're investing in the uh, future. Um, and, you know, given if this was five years ago or something along those lines, I wouldn't think that Pullman would necessarily need additional uh, planning. But, um, you know, we are growing extremely quickly, and my own. Uh, education and planning as well. Uh, definitely, I see that that it's an important next step. So I appreciate you investing in that future and um, pivoting to uh, deal with those challenges. So thank you, RJ. Great, thank you. Did come up in quarter three of 2021 too. So in terms of this budget, anyone else from the council would like to make a comment? RJ, RJ, you still got uh, any more for the budget? Uh, no, that's it for tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, very good. With that, we now go to economic development, pages 64 to 67, and Jennifer Hackman. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. It's my pleasure to present the proposed budget for the Economic Development Department for 2021 and 2022. Um, before I go into that, I'll highlight some of the department's activities over the last year. Of course, economic development began just a year ago, and the department reports to the city administrator, but works with colleagues throughout the city, including public works, planning, finance, and police, and also you, the mayor and council, who sets the goals the department looks to for direction. Uh, prior to COVID, the department was holding business retention and expansion meetings, worked with a WSU class to develop marketing plans for local businesses, and aided for the WSU Pathfinder program to proactively include business startups in the Pullman community. Um, also working to get to know the developers in the region as well as property owners and different brokers as well as startups. During COVID, um, that attention really needed to focus on business retention and business assistance. Um, during COVID, um, the department began a COVID resources page for businesses in addition to the economic development web pages began a weekly call with area partners to collaborate on stability and recovery efforts. 
a weekly email with city related and COVID information that goes out to about 100 people at this time. Assisted with council member records community poll, which established our local levels of consumer confidence and was really great information for residents and businesses alike. Implemented the regulatory relief program that council approved in which adjusted mark parking requirements and removed fees so that businesses could extend their business to their parking lots and sidewalks. And also filled in as the interim planning director for a couple of months. Currently, the department is still focused on business outreach and providing assistance where possible. And I want to take a moment to thank the mayor and council's efforts to provide information, reduce regulation, and provide some $360,000 in grants to the business community. I know that the small businesses in this community are extremely appreciative for this incredible support. This year, the department held about 75 business retention and expansion or business assistance meetings, referred about 40 businesses to additional resources like the Small Business Development Center. And the department is also looking forward and connecting and working with an expanding list of landowners, building owners, brokers, developers, and startups. Heading into 2021 and 2022, it will be important to continue working toward the goals mayor and council have established. In review of these goals and after surveying the council for input, I'm proposing the following objectives for the Economic Development Department for 2021 and 2022. And this is not in the budget workbook, so um, hold on with me as I just go through these, this list of five. This will go into the work plan. Number one, downtown revitalization. Number two, business retention and expansion. Three is continuing to attract and expand retail. Uh, four is partnerships to create place-based opportunities, and five support for commercial investment. The department is presenting a budget that aligns to these goals as efficiently as possible. So our 2021, the recommended budget is 159,000. Last year, the department was set up, and so some of the costs are reduced like office and minor equipment and interfund. Within the operating expenses, I propose an increase to marketing that connects to um, downtown redevelopment and retail objective, objectives, which would be to produce a professional marketing materials for both print and web. Um, dues and subscriptions in the budget is also reduced, but I propose adding the Suida dues to my budget. Training and travel are reduced for 2021, and that's mostly due to COVID, as I predict that conference activity may still occur in 2021 virtually, but that will probably increase in 2022 as recruitment and benchmarking trips and additional conferences um, begin to be held in person. Um, so that's reflected in 2022. Communications is reduced to reflect current charges. There is a placeholder um, in the operating expenses for $10,000 and that's for professional services. That is because between looking at downtown redevelopment, looking at the former city hall or other place-based opportunities, I predict the need for a, a feasibility or a marketing study. However, that line item would only be used if there is a grant um, to match against it. So that concludes my presentation of the proposed budget and I look forward to comments or questions that you have. Thank you so much. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, Eileen. Uh, this is a this is a new department, so a lot of this terminology may be may be new to, to some of us. Um, so we're going to kind of just hack down through some of this. Um, the what is a what exactly is a standard business retention outreach call? Can you give me an example of that? Sure. So. Today I held one um, with a chiropractor in town who is interested in expanding at some point. So we walked through current employees, kind of current practices, and it's a chance to say thank you for doing business in the city of Pullman, for choosing Pullman, and also a chance to ask about any challenges that the company or the business is currently experiencing, just for feedback, if that is finding workforce or attracting people to the business 
or um, there might be challenges um, that the business wants to share about its own P&L. And at that point, that's an opportunity for me to either refer that business to a business consultant, like the Small Business Development Center who works with small and medium sized businesses or to look for opportunities um, for that business that might be available through the Department of Commerce or um, other, types of, um, other types of resources. But it's also a chance to find out how we're doing and to again, thank the business for being in the city of Pullman and to find out what their plans are going forward. Um, in the meeting today, that business expressed a desire to build on to the property that they have within a couple of years and to potentially attract um, retail that is um, would be a good fit next to a, a chiropractor and potentially additional um, housing um, onto that kind of development. So, so that's that's an example of a business retention and expansion meeting. They normally last about an hour to an hour and a half, and and then there are follow up activities um, that maybe come out of that. So, so one of the other the terms that I wasn't uh, sure of in uh, in paragraph three of your uh, abstract here, who is the economic development affiliate? That's capitalized. I'm assuming that's some sort of a name. Yeah. So, um, this, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great question, Eileen. Thank you. Um, in the state of Washington, economic development affiliates are contracted by the Department of Commerce. And I believe there are about 34 of them in 39 counties in Washington. And they, um, they put together the regional economic development plan. So for us, that is SOWEDA. I've got some other things. Let somebody else get in here though. Um, Jen, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, you mentioned um, this meeting with a business owner today and uh, potential, um, you know, expansion and things like that. And, and you know, in this case, I'm, I'm aware of the, the business and I'm aware that they've had to go through, you know, zone issues and stuff. Um, so from a webinar that you and I both sat in about economic development, uh, one of the points that was brought up was, was code, city code. Um, how much, um, you know, how, where are we at with code and how much of your time, how much is your, of your effort um, <clears throat> do you foresee in the near future uh, giving recommendations to the council on different code um, that really can facilitate uh, progress and um, success in, in economic development um, feels like we probably have a lot of room that we can we can grow in that regard. Well, thanks for that question, Brandon. I guess what I would say is as soon as RJ was announced and came to the city, I think I, I was um, very anxious to get to know him very, really, really well. And he probably got sick of me, but, um, but I really see us working together um, and, and RJ does have a really good appreciation of economic development. And so, um, so I look forward to that process because there are, there are a number of um, code and, and changes in, in, in the downtown strategic plan. Um, and RJ is aware of that, I believe. And, um, and I think that, that, you know, there are a lot of things that, that can occur and move forward. And we'll have to work together and kind of set some some goals and some timeline for that. Thank, thank you. And I do realize that a lot of the code um, is administered by planning or by Pullman police. And it's not necessarily your position, but you, you would have the, I guess, the the insight uh, uh, as to which of those could help, you know, either either help our economic development progress or, or might um, be a barrier. So. Yeah, I mean, for an example, in the strategic plan, there was a recommendation to look at our heights in downtown. Um, so that would be one example if that is impeding new development. Um, and if we made a change, you know, we'll, we'll want to look at something like that. Okay, uh, Nathan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much. I really like what you were um, putting out here. And I just want to also recognize that I know there's some really, really interesting projects on the horizon that you've been involved in. 
um, you know, with WSU and they're interested in, in collaborating um, with all of us at the city. Uh, so I want to applaud you for that. I think also the there's an issue that it was brought up. Oh man, I think it was about eight years ago um, regarding uh, barriers uh, for businesses, um, especially downtown, when there was a certain when there were certain challenges with sanctuary uh, yoga and um, Pat. I think. We were both on at the same time regarding this. Um, you know, there was some effort to try and find how to um, alleviate those challenges um, and make the uh, process a little bit more seamless uh, because there were, you know, just these barriers for people to update or, or get their business downtown. So I really, really hope that you can uh, look at that, uh, maybe delve back into some of the um, meeting minutes that may be boring, but I know there's some, uh, there were some issues back there. I don't know how uh, challenging they are right now, um, but yeah, just wanted to point that out. And I'm sure okay. if Pat can fill in if, uh, yeah, need be, so. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Waller. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Anyone else? Going back to Eileen. Yeah, again, like I say, this is a new department and a lot of this is, is new. So you're going to you're going to kind of get it from me, I'm afraid. Um, in, in paragraph seven, you say that you're uh, continuously evaluating ways to strategically respond to the city's strength, um, basically SWAT. Is there a specific SWAT analysis that you're referencing as you as you develop your your strategies going forward? Or is that just kind of a figure of speech these days? Um, you know, council member, um, I, I believe that that has been something that I looked at myself informally. Um, I went through a series of conversations with a lot of stakeholders early on and, and also referenced materials um, that I reviewed from the council. So it, it would be more informal at this stage. Um, I, Kevin kind of dropped something on us here um, that in public works are looking at uh, things that are being done in other communities for comparison. And I think is there, I, I talk about opportunity, is there opportunities to look around mm -hmm. in other communities what they're doing for recoveries for their, for their downtowns and what their plans may be? I had one from Main Street uh, organization just drop across my email as we were signing on this evening. So I would, I would encourage that. Are, are, we, are we looking at what's going on in other communities or... I'll just sort of put that in your inbox, so to speak. Sure. So, yeah, um, and I'm, I'm really excited that you put in here that the city would benefit from updated marketing materials and that there's gonna be a sliver of money in the budget there. This is something that we've talked about and talked about and it's been a little bit contentious, but uh, yeah, if we, can, if we can kick loose those dollars or find that grant money and, uh, and move that forward with your, uh, with your energy behind that, that would be, that would be great. I mean, we've, we've done studies, we've done retail gap analysis, we've done, I remember seeing one 10 years ago from Greg Parch and it was the same as the one that we saw last year too. So we need to kind of a boots on the ground and an emotional appeal to, uh, to get our downtown moving uh, in, in terms of recovery. And I'm hoping that you can, you can throw your energy, you know, behind some of this. And the, the draft statement, um, the draft statement is really interesting. Um, Nurturing startups and commercial centers and corridors and vibrant out of date. By the way, I hate the word vibrant. So anyway, um, and it talks about diversity. Um, I got thinking about um, you know the lists that have been mentioned, and I got looking at various business lists. Is there any special outreach for minor? I think that Councilmember McCall was um, asking if there's outreach to minority businesses. Um, I, I will share that that is a particular interest of mine and, um, and I have, I have done outreach. I think we have a long way to go, um, to support, um, minority business owners. Um, but that is certainly a passion of mine. There are funding resources for that too, to help out. And, uh, Eileen looks like your internet froze up on you a little she bit. Froze. Any other uh, any other comments or questions? I see Al, you got your hand up. Al, 
I, I think Eileen froze I, there. <laughs> um, I, I just got a couple of things here in, in looking at this. Um, I appreciate that you mentioned the 360,000 in the original CARES Act money that the city of Pullman threw in. Don't forget we threw in another 75 after that. So uh, we're you. up to about 435,000 uh, there. Um, questions a little bit uh, from me in regards to your, the retention calls when uh, Eileen was asking about those. Um, you're making the calls or people are calling you. I'm, I'm a little confused as to how that's happening. It can happen both ways, but you know, if, but, but I make the calls and um, we'll make a, an appointment to go out to the business. Um, so it can work both ways though. And, and sometimes it's informal and sometimes there's a referral to me from another partner or a colleague would be great, but it can take place when, you know, a restaurant, for example, I sent, um, I sent information about the grant out and there was one restaurant that called and said, I, I don't know if I, if, can I still do this? And so I made an appointment to go out and sit down with that owner. And then from there, sometimes it's informal the business going and discovered that last year they had a flood and this year it's COVID. And so, you know, additional challenges. And I referred that business to the small business development center because they really needed somebody to go in as an analyst and, and look at their books. Um, so it can happen in a lot of different ways. But my goal is to do one or two of those, eventually getting up to one or two of those a week. So the, the list that you're working from in regards to who you're calling or the business list, because I see here, you know, that you've contacted uh, approximately 100. And I, I think uh, we have more than 100 in town. I think uh, there's all kinds of them. And then where are you getting that information? I, I think sometimes we have um, a little bit of a, a lack of lists or we have too many and we, <laughs> we don't have one central quote list no. of things. <laughs> And it, and it becomes really difficult and, and finding how to contact these people uh, is, is crucial. And, and, you know, this, this COVID situation has been an absolute crucial uh, situation. And I, I'm really disappointed that when you took over the manager position, helping with the city that we had to kind of 90% of our economic development work kind of quit. Uh, that, that, that's uh, concerning to me. Uh, because that's when we really needed to be going out and, and contacting folks. So, and it, not at your fault that you went there. I'm just saying it's too bad that we had to do that type of thing. Um, the, in regards to our partners, you refer a, a number of times in here to your, your development partners and things. Could you maybe name who some of our partners are that I'm, I mean, I see up above here, you've got a little list of the downtown association and things. Is that, is that a full complete list? Or when you say talking to the development partners, who are we really talking about? Well, it's actually a long list. Um, and economic development partners really come, fr they come from all over. Um, but I would consider um, partners to be the SWEDA, who is the EDA for the region. Um, the Port of Whitman, uh, Whitman County, um, Avista, the CAC, um, the SBDC, um, WSU. I consider all of those, Downtown Pullman Association, I consider all of those partners because opportunities can come about and, and we can work on them um, regardless um, of, of who they are. So depending on the kind of opportunity or project would, would likely define kind of the partnership that works on that. Um, in one of the opportunities um, Nathan was discussing, partners, potential partners are WSU and the Port of Whitman. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I know that our economic development per se, you know, we talk about development, but retention and all that is a really big part of it and, and more than normal right now. And making sure that we're contacting all the businesses 
uh, that are around town and, and creating maybe a good master list of things I think would be something that we should really uh, move forward trying to, to get done. I, a quick question for you, and this is tri a trivial thing, but the grant for the Riverwalk lighting, um, where that's you had 35,000 over here and 37,000 over here. So can you re refresh my memory where that's going from? on the river walk. Cause I, I don't know where we're starting and where we're ending. Cause I know that there's some lack of lighting between uh, the sanctuary yoga building and uh, oh dang it. What's the street that goes by the uh, uh, visitor center. The visitor the center. Yeah. So it's from the visitor center um, all the way over to Kamayakin there were some dark spots on oh, yeah. the river walk. And so the rural business development um, center, I, I talked with them, um, I think it was last year around this time. And I had some projects in mind from the downtown master plan and said, do, do any of these hit? And they said, actually, we like construction and that river walk one. If you have lighter, letters of support from businesses, we think that would probably uh, be a good one to apply for. So we went out and took a, took a look and I have to thank Ruth Younce, um in the public works department because she's really been the project manager, but we went out and assessed where. And so um, between the WSU visitor center and also all the way to the, tr to the trestle, actually we're adding um, some acorn lighting and then we're adding lights to the flat bridge. And then in the spring, when we get the approval, there'll be a lighting added to the trestle um, just to kind of highlight that, architecturally. Um, and so the civic trust was involved in, in that as well. And so that's kind of where it goes to. Okay, wonderful. And so in, in just a little bit on that, in deciding what the light poles were going to be in the acorn lighting and the color and all that kind of thing, how, how is that decided? Because is, uh, is it going to blend into what we may or may not do downtown? Yeah, it should. It was um, recommended by the Downtown Pullman Association Design Committee. So I worked with them on that project. Okay. Uh, just a couple other quick things here and then I'll, I'll be done here. Uh, I'm really with you in regards to, um, you know, you have in here updating marketing materials for retail attraction. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll go as far as saying, you know, retention and highlighting our our businesses that are here in town. And you use the word getting something professionally done. And I continue to go back to that. Uh, that's what we need to have. We need to have uh, some money spent on this so that whatever it is that we decide to do for a platform, it's professionally done. And uh, you know that will help a lot uh, with promoting current business and uh, bring some in. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, so other than that, um, I'm game with the other things in here and, uh, I appreciate, uh, the report here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Ann Parks. We haven't heard from you yet. So Ann, you're next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jennifer, I just want to thank you so much for this, uh, report and just really for everything that you've done. You are a new department. You are just in your, you know, ending your first year. And I, I see a lot of collaboration. You have been out in the community. You have been working with stakeholders. And, you know, with COVID, it's difficult to make appointments and go to businesses because a lot of them just aren't there. I have been a part of two businesses in the last year, and we both have had periods where we just weren't in the office because of COVID. So, um, I appreciate you're still trying uh, to Al's point of, you know, maybe you get a list out. I think too, we could communicate and pop, pop, maybe we already are, but like through the chamber newsletter, for example, and out in the do a public service ads and announcements uh, in the newspapers to say, Hey, this resource is available. If you'd like an appointment, you know, give Jennifer a call. And so that way we get the word out that that service is available and that might be a good way to handle that. But um, I think given all the challenges just by being new and also in our, in our world right now uh, with COVID, I really appreciate uh, the effort that you have put forth. Go to Nathan, then Eileen. Nathan. 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, Anne pretty much took all the words out of my mouth. Um, you know, Jennifer, you have, uh, I, in my opinion, done stellar given the challenges we faced uh, this year um, with the pandemic and uh, it being as has, has already been noted by uh, Ann and Eileen, a new department, um, trying to figure out exactly where to go, what to do, um, how best to serve the community um, and, and also keeping us in the loop. So I just want to recognize that, that you are only, you know, less than a year as has been stated and have just done a, a very stellar job. I'm very, very impressed. And I look forward to uh, your work and the investment you've made into the city, the community and uh, all of us as well. So thank you. Eileen. Thank you too. Yeah, I'm sorry I had a computer glitch of some sort, but at least now I'm not that weird color that I was. I have no idea what's going on here. But uh, uh, I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, the the grants, there's two grants that are mentioned in your abstract. One was the uh, for historic preservation, and that's not the same grant as the lighting grant, is it? No, uh, I'm sorry, um, Eileen, I need to refresh my memory. Where are you? Um, I'm on uh, paragraph five. It okay. says the CLG um, make a final presentation to the CLG committee, and that's certified local government, I think. And that's yes. and and that is for historic yes. preservation. Okay, yeah. So, so, so that I, was awarded. No, no. Um, <laughs> and um, this is a this is a thought on my part um, for us to consider because I. I talked to the Wenatchee downtown and one of the things they said that worked really well for them was that they got a grant to offer historic, historic preservation um, advisors um, and analysts for their downtown um, building owners so that they could help them determine if um, going in that direction would make sense for that, for that owner of that building. Um, based on the tax incentives that are available. So they highly recommended that. And I, I note that that, I mean, that's, that's on my list to explore, but that is not, it's not something that we were awarded. So my apologies for any confusion. Okay. Cause yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't seem to get those two together in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That right, please. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer, for your report. Very comprehensive. Um, I think it, I echo um, the thoughts of Nathan and Anne in terms of everything that you've been able to do given the monkey wrench that was thrown at you in March. Um, I think going forward, um, keeping with the, our, our focus, and that is with whatever we can do to help businesses with recovery. Um, well, at the same time, obviously, we want to try to recruit businesses, but I think the, the number one priority is, is helping with recovery. And certainly, um, you know, some of the CARES grants uh, are a good, a good start in that. But, you know, as we get further into this, what other kinds of inventive things can we be doing to help businesses stay afloat? So... Thank you. And again, I appreciate all the work you put into this report and what you've done in the first year that you've been here, given the difficult circumstances. Thank you. Pat, I appreciate that. Okay, anyone else? Uh, to answer one of Al's questions, uh, to give you an example of, uh, I had a former student that reached out to me on my private email and said, hey, I'm interested in uh, Pullman development. He's with a real estate firm up in Spokane. It was really nice to be able to refer him to Jennifer, economic development, and Jennifer's got an appointment with this person and another and his partner next week. So uh, that's sometimes they come to us and we can refer them to Jennifer and that really helps out as well. So yeah, thank that, you, uh, and I, again, I really appreciate that kind of help. Uh, I just, yeah. I, I had a comment and um, something for, for Jennifer, uh, the, I guess for all council members. So this uh, webinar that we had both attended 
um, it, it went through economic development strategies. And uh, today it was it was really eye opening for me. They they of course they talked broadly, but then also locally what you could do and and business retention and recovery and expansion was the number one economic development activity. Um, I absolutely would encourage Jennifer to keep, you know, keep getting to know our business owners. Um, business recruitment and site selection was a big thing. Uh, industry clusters was a big thing. And, and, and then of course, yes, they did narrow down and, and go into local things um, that, that deal, dealt with permitting and, and code, as I mentioned. Um, you know, a variety of infrastructure development was was one of the things on this list. But um, I'm looking at just the broad uh, overview here in front of me. Um, small business development was number four on this list. Uh, it, it really was business focused uh, for this economic development. Um, and yes, there were a lot of other things included in this, but, but they actually put this in uh, already prioritized. And, and then in addition to top loading, the most important things, they bolded those to really emphasize, uh, the importance of things like uh, business retention and recovery and expansion. And, um, and so, um, that would be, you know, my, my hope, um, Jennifer to keep, keep going out and getting to know those business owners, but then for all my, my council colleagues here, um, I will share this with you. I'll share the slides that, that we got. Um, I think it's, uh, it's really helpful to to see this from from some of these state experts and and maybe can help inform our decision making as, as it relates to um, budget considerations, but then also to um, you know to help uh, in our relationship uh, working relationship with Jennifer. Thanks, Brandon. And there's another webinar next month that I think three of you will be joining me on so we can do the same and share that around when that one comes around too. That's great. All right. It, well, with that, we'll move on to public works. And the first one comes up as arterial streets and we go back to Kevin Gardas and looks like it could be a Kevin Gardas show from right now on to all kinds of budgets. So Kevin, thank you very much for maintaining those budgets. And now it's your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Arterial Street Fund budget begins on page 82. Uh, this fund primarily consists of capital improvement projects included in the city's transportation improvement program, or TIP. The city's capital improvement program and transportation improvement program were approved by council earlier this year in September. Uh, before diving into the budget, uh, let me touch on some goals and related tasks that we have completed where work is in progress. These include development of a CBD master plan, passage of a complete streets ordinance, completion of a pavement rating survey to provide data to assist with de decisions related to street road uh, and repairs. And on that last one, um, had COVID not hit, we would have made a presentation to council um, in the spring or summer about this, brought our consultant in but we've just been sitting on that right now, but the work is done. Um, and those were three council goals that I, I just touched on. The proposed 2021 budget for arterial streets is 2,072,000, which, which is a decrease of $1,107,600 compared to the 2020 budget. The proposed 2022 arterial streets budget is 3,352,000. Expenditures in this fund can vary widely depending on the particular capital projects proposed in any given year. Notable projects in 2021 are completion of our arterial streets resurfacing 2020 project. You remember we had to push that back uh, to next year due to problems with the single bid received and the required minority um, bid uh, participation. Conceptual design work on downtown enhancements is programmed in for 2021. Uh, we're earmarking 50000 in our budget for that, um, and our plan would be to um, would be kind of a combination, have a consultant provide us a, a little bit of uh, their time to help us maybe with some drawings. We're starting to get overloaded, um, I think, with our engineering uh, workload as far as the various projects we're working on, and so we may uh, bring in a consultant just to help us do some drafting. Uh, and Jen and I have talked, uh, we'd work pretty closely together on developing this and bringing it forward with workshops for 
council and for the downtown folks um, to get uh, to get their buy-in and their their feedback. So um, we've got that budgeted for 2021, and we've uh, put some money in the budget for 2022 to do those improvements to actually put them in. Some of it will depend on um, if adequate funding is identified, whether that's in a current city budget or going out for grant funding, but uh, all that is still to be worked out. Uh, we've got design work on a roundabout at North Fairway and Terraview Drive, and that's in 2021. Uh, again, assuming grant funding is obtained, and if it is, then we would proceed with the actual construction in 2022. Uh, continued work on a traffic signal at Grandin Center, uh, we've been waiting um, up until fairly recently for WashDOT to uh, approve a traffic signal at that location, which they, they have now. So uh, we'll be moving forward on that again. And a start on design for the grand and main signal enhancements. That's a grant uh, council approved applying for a while back that would improve the traffic signals in town. And again, assuming that grant comes in, um, that'll be another project for us to work on. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the city completed a complete streets ordinance in 2020, um, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, we completed it early this year in 2020. Unfortunately, um, TIB's budget for complete streets in 2021 has been eliminated, but it may return in 2022. And if so, we have a placeholder for a complete streets project um, that year. So assuming we can get a TIB grant. Uh, many arterial streets, Projects are grant dependent, so if there isn't a grant, or, or so if the grant doesn't come in, then we typically don't do the project. Goals supported by this budget include uh, from the 2018 goal setting retreat under community identity and downtown is creating the master plan and continuing to work on implementation. Under strategic long-term planning and dependable, dependable infrastructure, passing the complete streets ordinance and that enhances multimodal access on Airport Road and Terraview Drive. Community partnerships continue to champion the Pullman Moscow Regional Airport by supporting the development of a new terminal building under livability and multimodal transportation and continuing to improve bike and pedestrian trails. Um, and then from the 2019 goal setting retreats, the downtown master plan implementation and supporting the new terminal. So um, that's it for arterial streets and I'd be happy to answer questions at this point. Okay, Al. There we go. Um, I had my thing minimized, couldn't hit the microphone. Uh, Kevin, just a, a quick question in regards to the Grand Avenue and Main Street signal improvements. Now, are we talking specifically about just electronics or are we talking about physically doing something i'm i'm thinking about the downtown master plan and all that and i don't want to spend money on something before we get going on you know what i'm saying yeah no i think they're separate but i've got clayton uh on the wings and that was a grant application that he prepared so clayton if you're available maybe just chime in here please you bet good question al um, so this uh, grant application was based on a local road safety plan that we did earlier this year. And one of the things we found was there's a lot of accidents at the signalized intersections. And so this, if we were successful with the grant, uh, which we'll know later this year, would take 17 of our signals and it would update the infrastructure. So the traffic controllers, the traffic cabinets, we have a lot of old cabinets to current state of the art equipment. It would get us new signal heads that are 12 inches instead of right now we have a mix of 12s and 8s. Uh, reflectorized borders. We could look at left uh, flashing left yellow, yellow arrows. Um, and then the other thing is the illuminated street name signs, which you see at some of the signals already. We'll actually increase those to get taller letter heights so they're more visible. Okay. So I my computer froze and I missed like 90% of what you just said. So um, I, I've been having some issues. Um, so I can't, I'm not gonna make you say it again, but anyway, my concern is to make sure that whatever we're doing 
in that designated downtown area that falls within the the master plan that uh, BDS did that we're making sure that anything we do, you know, fits in all of that. Because I think there's some thought about the changing of that intersection still with the island and and things. And whether you said something about that when I wasn't on here, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, that was my concern. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, make sure they're coordinated, Al. Thank you. Eileen. Yeah, sorry about I'm having hitches and glitches as well. The um, was the the grant that we're hoping for the traffic signal improvement grant is this the one that we missed just by a whisker here last year or so? That, Correct. Uh, okay. Yeah, we we didn't have enough serious accidents, so we fell just. Oh. Uh, we were the last project not to get first project not to get. Well, let's. Let's cross our fingers that we don't have anybody hurt, but we get the grant. I don't know. That's kind Correct. of weird. That, yeah. That's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and this is the one in which you can do on your computer. You can adjust all the signals instead of doing it manually at each one of the controllers. That's one of the ones you've had proposed as well, right? Yes. Okay. So. Any other comments on this? Okay, Nathan? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you also, Kevin. You know, I really just want to tell you I appreciate you uh, moving forward on the, you know, the goal that I, uh, looking at the streets and uh, grading them on which needs to be done first. Um, I really, really think that will help uh, future for the budget. And I know it's a big, big haul, but you've been doing a great job. So just wanted to uh, let you know and, and tell you I appreciate it, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, Brandon. And yeah. then we'll go to Parks. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And I, I echo what Councilmember Weller said. I, I think grading or, or scoring those streets, um, I like the idea, really like the idea of using data to in inform, you know, the decision making we have. Um, I don't know what the matrix looks like. I don't know when we're going to be able to do some of this work, um, but I, I do I do think that, that we'll be able to um, make smarter decisions because of it. So um, my question in regards to some of the work downtown, we, ha we had the pop-up trial and um, I, I would say we learned quite a bit um, and, and all that data, um, you know, we collected this uh, resident feedback and then um, my recollection is that you were going to go back to the drawing board and um, we would start some design. What um, what's the timeline on on some of these these changes? Considering all all the budget, um, when can we expect you know a, a first first look at a uh, at some draft some some con concepts um, you know something like that that we can we can see and start start thinking about um, even if it's not formal yet. Um, I guess. My thought would be probably late spring, early summer. Um, if we're, more than likely, we would go out and get some consultant help on this. So, putting together the consultant contract just to help with the drafting will take a little time getting them on board and up to speed. Um, I don't think once we get them on board, it'll take too long to get a base drawing down, something that we can use for talking um, and presentations and, and some initial conversations and feedback. So I would expect by late spring, early summer, um, Jen and I will be making a presentation to council on this. Okay, and that was my next question is how, how closely you would be working with, with RJ, with Jen, on, on making sure that all these components um, came together since, since de the downtown and the way people move and all that is certainly more than just you know the engineering um, aspect of it. So, um, sure. Okay, so late spring, early early summer. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Ann. Kevin and Clayton, I just wanna thank you so much for the work you do, particularly for how responsive you are whenever I come to you with a resident's concern, you always address it and, and get back to the, um, the resident, which I appreciate. And then anecdotally, I, I really, we, we I really appreciate our street signs. <laughs> that sounds weird, but I was in Ypsilanti, Michigan, just outside of Ann Arbor a few weeks ago. And I'm telling you what, the street signs were about this big. 
<laughs> and when you're trying to, on a one way, trying to find your kid's place for the first time or whatever, I, it was really remarkable how poor the street signs were. They, they were not, it, so anyway, it just made me so glad to get back here and see the big lit signs and the, even just all of our signage. I uh, really, it gave me a renewed appreciation. So thank you. You're welcome. Apparently they haven't met federal standards back there because you're, That's you're true. a lot of federal guidelines and doing these signs too. So. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next budget, which is streets. That's page 84 to 85. Um, so just to kind of go over, you know, what the responsibilities of the street fund are, you know, we maintain the street lights in town, the road signs, as, as Ann just mentioned, um, uh, striping, traffic lights, uh, we maintain all of the traffic lights in town, um, which coincidentally is different than Moscow. The state maintains all of the traffic lights in Moscow. So just difference across state lines. Um, we do resurfacing, all of the, you know, the pavement restoration type projects, potholes, um, snow and ice control. So those are all the things that I consider um, kind of non-discretionary. Those are the things that we really have to do um, for safety, for um, just kind of maintaining the basics. Um, and then we're, when we get into, you know, uh, resurfacing and sidewalks and things like that, that's where... Um, there's a little bit more discretionary money. Um, and that's usually where the pinch comes is with the discretionary money because once you do all the non-discretionary things, there, there isn't as much money left over as, as we would like. Um, the proposed 2021 and 2022 budgets for the street fund are $4,633,918 and $3,110,609 um, respectively. For comparison, the 2020 budget is $2,882,679. Um, this budget includes program salary step increases. It includes a bike and pedestrian master plan, which is actually, a, I know it's a city council goal um, from 2018. It, we actually went through the selection process um, back kind of about the time COVID hit. And then with obviously with the budget and revenue impacts, we set that aside, but um, we have the consultant selected. I'm working on negotiating a contract and I would like to get them going um, probably early next year is, is kind of what I'm thinking. And so I put that in the budget um, for 2020. Um, and then my plan would be similar to the central business district master plan to form a stakeholder group on that. Um, of local folks and see, you know, that have interest in bike and uh, pedestrian master plan, and then we'll help guide, help the consultant and guide the work from there. So um, we've got conceptual design work for airport road in the street fund. And during the CIP presentation, we did the, the TIP presentation as well. We talked about a potentially a joint project kind of down the road on airport road with the county. But there's another reason to move forward fairly quickly on kind of conceptual design for airport road. And that's the new terminal project. I spent all day in Moscow today on interviews for the airport terminal to select a contractor. That project is moving forward very quickly. Um, they want to be under construction um, as, as the mayor knows, uh, probably this summer. Um, so it's going to happen fast. And so if we want to, uh, it gives us an opportunity now, if we get a consultant on board and kind of work out the concept for what we want for airport road, the multimodal concept, um, we could potentially get part of that maybe built with the airport terminal project, or at least set up so we can add to it without having to redo a lot of things down the road. So that's another reason to kind of move forward on that one um, in the near term rather than taking our time. Um, the sidewalk repair budget, I know council member Sorensen will be interested in this is 70,000 and that's what you know we've been budgeting for the last few years. And we've also budgeted 80,000 for sidewalk infill, which is the same number we've had for the last couple of years. Uh, capital projects, other capital projects include accelerated streets resurfacing. So um, 
We've got the arterial streets resurfacing, which is federal grant money. That's spring, Crestview, and Harvest. That's a project we do about every three to four years because um, we build that, that grant money up until we can do one project. Um, and then we've got uh, city funds that we do accelerated streets with. So in order to balance the workload and make it a little bit easier for engineering, we, we've decided instead of trying to do an accelerated streets project every year, we would do one in the two years out of three when we're not doing the federal project. So federal project comes in one year, and then we just add that budget from that year we didn't do the arterial streets project to the other two years. So instead of doing $600,000 a year, we do $900,000 for those two years um, that, are, that we're not doing the federal project. So that helps us workload-wise, but we'll make bigger accelerated streets resurfacing projects in those two years. Um, we also are hoping to resurface Terraview Drive from SR270 to Airport Road. And this is a TIB grant we put in uh, along with the roundabout TIB grant. So we'll find out about those later this month when uh, TIB uh, puts out their scoring. Goals supported by this budget include creating a master plan for downtown, conducting a professional bike and pedestrian plan, uh, con continue to champion the airport by supporting the new terminal building and multimodal transportation. And I think I'd like this to share my screen here because similar to um, the protective inspections and the strategic planning work, we also have um, done strategic planning work in m &O. So can everybody see my screen? Okay. Um, so the top is the current setup, and, and I've abbreviated this because the m and org chart is very busy. So I just wanted to show the positions that we're proposing to change, the current way they exist, and what we're proposing to do with them. So we're going to, one of our proposals in m and is to get more specialized. Um, Right now, all of the maintenance workers work on everything. And so they have to know how to do water line. They have to know how to clean sewers, work on traffic signals. It's basically a jack of all trades where um, it's hard to really specialize in one area when you have to be responsible for so many things. And so as the city has grown, um, the need for, it's kind of common as you go from a small city to medium size, um, the need for more specialized folks in m and So what we're proposing to do in the long term is split the m and uh, maintenance workers into two groups. Uh, one would be um, a water side, and currently we have an operations side and a maintenance side. And on the operations side is the primarily maintaining the water system. So what we would do is we would move some of the maintenance workers over, maybe four of them from the right side of the lower screen um, in the future, I'm not showing it now, but move those over um, into with the operations technicians and they would be responsible for operating and maintaining the water system. It's kind of a natural and that's what most of the peer cities that we looked at, the same structure they have. Um, but for this budget, again, because of COVID, we are really trying to minimize the impact on the expenses and um, due to lost revenue. And so um, we're a little fortunate in public works that the public works funds aren't, haven't been as affected negatively as a general fund. I mean, we still have very healthy reserves in, in the funds. And so the, the public works funds are all in relatively good shape, but, you know, we're also cognizant of you know, the unknown with where the economy is going. And so we want to just be cautious and conservative. So what we're proposing with this budget is to convert the operations supervisor position into a utility manager. The utility manager would uh, supervise the operation side, which is currently the, the water operations. And it would then also supervise the remainder of the, the m and folks um, in the street, sewer, and storm side. We would, we currently have a maintenance supervisor position in the upper um, part of the, the slide that is vacant, and we would 
proposed to convert that to a street sewer storm supervisor position. And that would most likely be a no cost change. The utility manager uh, would probably be a slight bump in pay because of a little bit more added responsibility, but fairly minimal budget impact. And then I think the main impact of what we're proposing, and this would be split uh, between streets and utilities. So that would be water and sewer um, and also the storm water budget. So this isn't going to impact the street fund 100%. These costs are going to be spread out over all four for those funds. And so uh, we're proposing to add two maintenance workers. Um, and really when we went through um, the strategic planning work, that was kind of the main thing that stood out is, you know, as Pullman's grown and we add more miles of everything, streets and sewer lines and water lines, we're just, it's getting harder and harder to keep up with maintenance. And so um, we wanna add two frontline maintenance workers so we can uh, keep up with that. Um, so that's our proposal. And at this point, I think I'd entertain any questions from council. Questions, and again, I can't see everyone right now. So if you have your hand up and I can't see you. Okay, now we got it. Okay, Brandon, okay, go Brandon, Thanks. then we'll go to Eileen. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Kevin, thank you, very detailed report. Um, and, and I do support the shift there, um, knowing, knowing what they do and, um, I, I've got three quick things. Um, first of all, the Spring Street Crestview to Harvest. Um, I remember that that was something that we we were going to do this year, and then we uh, declined to take action based on, um, I guess, a lack of certain demographics among the the company that uh, won the bid. If if I'm not mistaken, is that is that then? Are we going to go out to bid again with that? Um, is that uh, something that we'll have at some point in the in the near future? Yep. So um, we were just talking about that this week. I think our city engineer Kara Haley is planning to get that out within the next two weeks. It'll be back out to bid. The problem that we had before was um, WashDOT changed. You know, anytime we do a federal project, they have to evaluate it to um, look at at minority um, contractor participation and they set goals on federal projects, uh, certain percentages. And, and on this particular project earlier this year, they, they kind of threw us a curveball because um, in the past, we've um, been able to meet the goal with any kind of um, what's considered a, a dis, a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, disadvantaged business. And so DOT had gone back and looked through and evaluated their program and they decided that white women owned businesses were not disadvantaged anymore. They'd reached parity with um, everybody else. And so uh, they removed them from the possible pool that we could, the contractors could use to um, get subcontractors. And Unfortunately, those are the type of firms that we have in our area that we typically use a lot. And so um, the contractors, the bidders weren't able to find um, this other category of bidders washed out wanted um, for subcontractors, which were all of the other disadvantaged businesses other than white women owned firms. And so um, we asked Washout to go back and reevaluate that because we don't want to end up in the same place again, um, open bids and find out the, the bidders can't meet that requirement. And so um, they've gone back and evaluated it and they've gone back to the old, the old rules. So those are the rules we're familiar with. I don't think there'll be a problem this time around and we expect to go out in the next couple of weeks and probably be bringing a construction contract to council for award in December or January. Okay, so maybe my next question was a moot point um, regarding if you can put those as part of the requirements so so that they would already meet that. Um, it, we do we have to go back out to bid if if the rules now are different and can we go back to the original? Um, we have to go back out to bid again because oh, okay. they have every all the bidders have to have the same information. Oh, okay. Um, understood. Uh, in, and thanks for following up because you know, you know that there's a pocket of people that is going to absolutely uh, want this to happen because multimodal was was uh, definitely part of that and, and traffic calming. So 
um, we, we had some things in the works and um, we were going to all do do all those things as part of resurfacing. Um, you know, sidewalks, you mentioned sidewalks and um, uh, Nathan and I had both talked about, you know, the, the streets and being able to evaluate streets and then make those decisions. Do, are we, is there any kind of data that we're using for um, the evaluation of these sidewalks? I, 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 I seem to remember that, you know, this was a, a passion that council member Weller had when we talked about a small segment of sidewalk somewhere and, and we, I think we declined to do that section uh, before, but how, how are we making the decision on that 70,000 plus dollars on, on infill on where, where those are needed and um, you know, are, are we doing pedestrian counts or, or how are we doing that? Um, it's, um, it's not as data driven uh, perhaps as um, Councilman Weller had proposed. Um, I think with sidewalks, it's a little tougher, at least on the repair side, you know, where we repair sidewalks, the infill um, part of it is, you know, this year was fairly easy because of New City Hall, we had a, a vacant gap right next to New City Hall. So that, that was kind of a no brainer. Um, but we typically uh, go out and ask for, um, you know, feedback from our engineering staff on what they've seen out there. You know, we're constantly getting um, emails and feedback from the general public on sidewalks that they think we should be out there repairing. So we we generally know where the repair and the holes are. Um, I, I think sometimes it gets a little tough in some areas because we've, we've kind of taken care of the low hanging fruit. And so like on College Hill, for example, you know, in the core area, there really isn't a whole lot of infill left up there. And the infill that is left is very expensive. And so that's often a trade-off for a, a thing we have to evaluate is whether we try to stretch those infill dollars and make them go as far as we can, or we tackle some of these harder, more difficult ones, but maybe it's an important um, block that a lot of people use for walking and, you know, they have to walk in the street for a block. And so even though it might be expensive, it, it's um, something we probably should tackle. So yeah. Um, and I think that's, yes, I appreciate that. I think that's where I was trying to go is we sometimes, you know, how are we matching, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe something is more expensive, maybe it's less, but we know where the, the people are, right. We, I don't know that we have a, a some kind of ongoing live heat map or something that's collecting the data. Um, but that would be, that would be interesting and, and help us make those decisions. Um, so that was a, that was a curiosity. Um, and my, my last point, it's not a question. Um, and then I, I see Al probably has a sidewalk question. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, uh, our, thank you on the bicycle circulation plan. Uh, I mean, Bill Clinton was our president when, when that was last done. And I know that there have been some, some folks that have really been asking for this. And, uh, you know, in spite of the fact that we, we had a number of changes and transportation things and CIP changes and whatever, um, you're making this happen. And I, I think that's really important. And, and I would imagine that because of COVID and, and, um, and people just trying to get out and get a little fresh air, uh, Bryce Erickson will tell you that people are riding bikes right now and, and having this, um, this plan updated, I think is greatly appreciated by many. And um, I, I am one of those. Thank yeah, we're going to go, we're going to go in order and Eileen is next, then comes Nathan and then Al. Okay. Eileen. All right, thank you. Um, just um, in, in uh, this seems to be my evening for terminology. Um, we have the High Street Downtown Enhancement Project, and we were hoping to see a timeline on that. And like I say, with all the hitches and glitches tonight, I may have missed your comments, and I apologize for that, Kevin. We have the BDS plan, and then we have what I think you referenced as the master plan. Were you referring to the bicycle and pedestrian master plan? or is the master plan still yet something to be developed that will knit all these things together? I get these questions all the time. People say, well, what's the master plan? And like, once again, is that a figure of speech? Is that a document that I can reference somebody to? And we've also been promised to have council uh, input uh, in workshop form in utero on all of these things. And so, yeah, I'm just gonna throw that at you, Kevin, and hope, uh, hope I can get something here. 
Uh, sure. Um, so master plan, uh, the way I think about it, I mean, m- mainly what I'm referring to is the central business district master plan, but there's also a bike and pedestrian master plan that um, council member Chapman had just mentioned. So if I don't provide the first part, I could see where it'd be confusing, but um, the master plan that I'm referring to mostly is the downtown plan. So, and then the high street project, Eileen, um, I have money budgeted in the utility fund because we're l- trying to extend water line. And so we often try to, where we can, you know, if we can take advantage of a utility project to improve a street, we, we do that. Um, and so that was our strategy with high street. So we have money budgeted to start looking at what we want to do there as far as the utility extension. And then ultimately what we want that plaza to look like. So we're planning to work on that as well. And I and I'm home and I'm planning on having significant input on that as I know other council members are. Sure. Okay. Nathan's next and then Al. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I really liked what Brandon Brandon was saying. Um, you know, if there's a way in the future, I'm not saying now, um, looking at a data-driven approach towards sidewalks, I really like that expansion, what Brandon was was discussing. And I think that's a very, very uh, intelligent way to deal with um, some of the challenges that we've been facing with sidewalks. And I just got to give some props here. Uh, Al is really the sidewalk champion. So uh, appreciate, I appreciate it, Brandon, you, you call me out, but I got to give that to Al. So in any case, um, Kevin just wanted to, to say that you know, what Brandon was saying, I think, is a really, really interesting approach, a good approach, if it's possible in the future. I'm sure it would be expensive, um, but I do feel also, as with the streets, it would be a good payoff. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Al Sorensen. Yeah, uh, I'll go back to some of this sidewalk stuff and infill. Uh, Kevin, I can't even remember how many years ago we started on this thing. And, and there was an inventory done, Brandon, of the entire city uh, uh, by staff, right, Kevin? That's correct. Of, of where, we, where we had gaps in coverage. Uh, and uh, I've been involved with this project uh, for a long, long time. And, and I'll tell you that we have done the absolute best possible to infill the most amount of sidewalk with the least amount of money. And Kevin is absolutely right. But we are we are getting to the point now where what's left are fairly expensive projects, uh, retaining walls, removing of things. Right, Kevin, am I? Right, especially and, in, in high traffic areas, um, right. And so, Brandon, there, there, it wasn't just a random situation of how we decided what to do. Um, I actually spent two different summers, and I've driven around, and I have looked at every single one of these. And I was input, uh, helping with input as to trying to figure out which ones would benefit the general public and Pullman the most. So it wasn't just a random situation of how this was getting done. There was a lot of input from Kevin's staff. Um, and I got to give a shout out to Sam, uh, because Sam was the main guy working on this with me and he would meet me at places. And we went around and made sure that we were getting the high traffic areas. We really concentrated on college Hill for the students and safety. And a lot of this is about safety. You guys, when I talk about sidewalks, it's about the safety of, of our residents in town. And, and I have a problem with them walking the streets. I'd love them. I'd love there to be sidewalks everywhere that, that so that people wouldn't walk in the streets. But I don't want you to think that we're not trying to do this in a, in a logical way, because I think we have done the absolute best possible. And I think we continue to do that. And, and there's still the list. Okay. Um, and I'm sure that Kevin could provide that if anybody wants to see it. Uh, but we continue to use these chunks of money in the best way possible. I just, I want you to understand where, where this has been going for a long, long time. Yeah, no, thank you, Al. Um, And and let me clarify. I, I absolutely um, 
don't think that it was random at all, right? Um, there, there's certainly logic to it. What, what I'm saying is there was also logic to, um, you know, when we would, would, when we would fix certain streets or resurface streets and we started to use data, which sometimes is a little different than logic. And, and so, you know, my, my recommendation is if we have that opportunity and I, and I, I don't know that we would want to spend a lot of money. Um, it might be worthwhile because if we are at a point where there are very few uh, options left or, you know, and they're all expensive, where, where would we spend that? Right. How, how do we determine between option A and option B and, and maybe logic is the best way to move forward. Um, but if, if data is available or there's a way to do that, um, which is why I mentioned pedestrian counts, um, that, that gives you a measurable, at least some something that you could hang on to to make that logical decision. Um, I think that would be helpful. There's, but there's no question, right, that we've made great strides. And um, I, I also I agree with you. Um, kudos to Kevin and his staff and, and Al, thanks for championing this for so long. Yeah. I, I've known about this for for a long time before I was on council. Sidewalk, sidewalk Sorensen. <laughs> okay. Any others before we move on to uh, utilities? Okay. Utilities next. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so... And we'll mention ninety four to ninety six. Yep. Um, this. The utility fund is utilized to maintain and operate the city's potable water system, sanitary sewer collection system, and its wastewater treatment plant. Um, I've covered the changes we're proposing to m &O, So again, that is included in, in the utility fund budget. Um, also, uh, if you remember back to my protective inspections presentation earlier tonight, um, there is one building inspector position that will be funded at 50% out of the utility fund for 2021 only. And that's for construction inspection related to city projects or private development projects. Um, we have included new electric vehicle charging stations in the budget. Uh, these are needed to support electric vehicle purchases in the future with the utility fund and within the utility fund and ERD. There is also a contribution to purchase new software and consultant assistance with selecting and configuring a new GIS-based computer maintenance management system or CMMS for short. Um, and I've got Art Garrow available if you have any questions on that. Um, and this is critical, uh, critical step to implementing a 311 system. So as the that's one of the things we really spent a lot of time on with our strategic planning work in MO is the city has a number of initiatives that we're trying to do. And so we want to make sure we have the resources, which is staff time and, and funding to get this stuff accomplished. And a number of these things are dependent on each other. So if we don't at the outset, make sure it's all, we'll all integrate together smoothly, you know, we'll have problems. And so Art and his staff have spent a lot of time kind of noodling out how all these pieces fit together. Um, and so we're planning to go ahead and get started on that um, as well in the next two years. Goals supported with this budget include dependable infrastructure, community partners, partnerships around water conservation and a long-term sustainable water supply and technology improvements and modernizing city codes. Um, and I, I'm gonna run through all three systems. I'll start with the water system, um, let you ask questions at the end of that, and then I'll do sewer, and then I'll do SDP after that. So currently the city pumps approximately 900 million gallons of groundwater from the Grand Juan Aquifer each year and distributes it to an estimated 5,500 service connections. A budget breakdown for the utility fund is shown on page 96. The proposed 2021 and 2022 budgets, and I, I backed out the water portion just so I can present it. Um, so you'll be able to compare it from year to year. Um, the proposed 21, 2022 budgets for the water portion of the utility fund are 6,123,812 and 8,268,570 respectively. For comparison purposes, the 2020 budget is $5,700,000. And a, a big, reason that the utility fund budgets 
change significantly from year to year is capital. That's that's really the driver with a lot of our funds. Um, highlights include program salary step increases, projected completion in 2021 of a 10 year water system plan update. We're currently right in the middle of that, um, which will include a public meeting uh, in 2021 to discuss the city's water conservation program. So this is just kind of a, a pre, you know, a, just planting a seed to, we'll come back to council um, in next year, probably in spring, summer time, and wanna talk about water conservation and what the city's goal should be for the next 10 years. We've done a really good job of, of lowering per capita water demand through our water conservation efforts to date, and we wanna keep that up. Um, we'll continue to support the Palouse Basin Aquifer Committee in our budget. Um, and its water supply alternatives project. And we are budgeting $10,000 each year to hire a consultant to assist with city code updates. I know that's uh, something that council had asked for in goals. So there are a number of, you know, kind of fairly detailed um, portions of city code related to the utility fund. And it's time that we went through and upgraded some of those. And so uh, we could do that with staff time, but uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're finding we're getting overbooked, and so it would really make sense for us to hire a consultant to help us with some of these code updates. So we're budgeting a little bit of money for that. And in water, that's the cross-connection control, backflow control. We, we need to update that code. Um, we are looking to complete a water and sewer rate study in 2022. So um, we typically perform rate studies after we do a water system plan update, just to check in, make sure you know what we're charging in rates will uh, work for the next six years, or in this case, 10 years, because it's a 10-year plan. So um, I don't know that the rate study will actually cover the full 10 years. That's a lot of projections. So we might make it a five-year plan and then come back and just re revisit it at the midpoint of the 10-year update and then decide whether we want to uh, do anything with rates again at that point. Um, but at this point, I'm not expecting, you know, anything major as far as rates go, but it's just good business practice to go through that and make sure we're in good shape and there won't be any surprises down the road. Uh, major capital includes fluoride analyzer replacement. We're looking at a total of four of those over a two-year period. Um, and we you know, we disinfect the water, we carry a, a chlorine residual in the water system, and that's required by the state. Um, and fluoride is the other uh, chemical that we add at a very small dose. Um, and so we're going to replace and update our fluoride analyzers. A water system control panel replacement, we're planning to do one of those per year. And then as we do every year, we program for uh, miscellaneous water line replacements. Sometimes those are done in conjunction with an accelerated street project, sometimes on their own. Um, additional water system capital is identified in the 403 account, which is utility capital projects. And I'll talk about those later. Those are typically multi-year, large dollar projects. Um, and the water budget includes a transfer to the utility capital fund to pay for those capital projects identified there. And at this point, I'll pause and see if there are any questions. Questions? Uh, I see Mike Urban's got his hand up. Sure, I just wanted to uh, touch on the rate study because this is something Kevin and I have been discussing for quite some time when they went from the six year to the 10 year. And, what would a 10 year rate study mean and how would that look at year seven where we wish maybe we would have still been doing a six year study. So initially, yeah, the, the initial thought was do it in a uh, five year and then go back and do an update for the next five year um, process. So that's very much on the top of our minds because as we've learned, um, things can change pretty quick around here and, um, we just want to make sure that we're not underbilling our utility to make sure it's a pro it's a functional and delivering the goods and everything that our citizens need. So I just wanted to touch on that for a moment. Okay. Uh, seeing none, let's move on. Okay. On. Uh, next up is the sanitary sewer budget of the utility fund. The city maintains approximately 96 miles of sewer lines, including four sewer uh, pump stations. 
The proposed 2021 and 22 budgets for the sewer maintenance portion of the utility fund are $3,575,705 and $1,851,216 respectively. For comparison purposes, the 2020 budget is $1,752,476. The sewer budget includes program salary step increases, bond payments on the SR270 uh, sanitary sewer extension, beginning on a general sewer plan in 2021. So after we wrap up the water system plan update, we are planning to do a general sewer plan update um, in 2021. The last time we did one was 2010. So it's about 11 years old. Um, it includes uh, transfers to the utility capital account, similar to water for um, capital projects there. Um, and it includes uh, funding for Canyon View Drive to Darrow Street Path. That's a project that's um, jointly funded with bond proceeds and also utility funds because it provides a walking path, but it also provides utility maintenance for part of it. So um, as we've done on other projects, we've gotten creative and used some utility funds where it made sense. And then the rest of that project is bond funding. Um, we've budgeted for consultant assistance on our CMMS upgrade project, which I mentioned earlier, and consultant help with city code revisions. And in case of the sewer, uh, sewer maintenance part, it would probably be our pretreatment standards um, that are part of city code that dictate what people can discharge to the wastewater system, um, sewer system. And again, I'll pause here and take any questions. Looks like you can continue on. Okay. Uh, last but not least is the sewage treatment plant budget, probably my favorite um, based on where I've spent a lot of my career. The city's wastewater treatment plant processes approximately 1 billion gallons of wastewater annually, as well as land application of approximately 400 to 500 dry tons of biosolids per year. The 2021 and 2022 budgets for sewer treatment are $7,022,132 and $5,690,442 respectively. For comparison purposes, the 2020 budget is $5,562,836. The STP budget includes continuing work on a WSU flow and loading study that is delayed because of COVID. Um, if you remember, council already authorized uh, delaying um, or extending our current agreement with WSU one year because it was going to take us an additional year to collect the flow data because COVID, you know, with the university folks not returning at full, full staff and uh, full contingent, um, the flows coming from WSU aren't what we would normally expect. And so we're now going to have to delay it one more year because of COVID. Um, the fact that WSU is not going back in the spring um, so I'll be bringing another uh, amendment to council probably in the next month or so to add another year to that agreement. Um, it includes funding for consultant assistance with electrical panel replacement at the wastewater treatment plant. We have some old panels there that um, aren't considered safe anymore. So we're gonna get those removed and replaced. We've got bond and loan payments associated with the UV disinfection project. And I would love to give council a tour of that um, when COVID isn't such an issue. Um, in fact, Clayton will probably be the one that leads that tour. Um, and we're also paying back a loan on the secondary process improvements projects. Um, and because we do 10 year loans, believe it or not, in another three years that loans paid off. Um, so uh, that's looking good. Uh, CMMS upgrades transfers to utility capital projects um, that we talked about to that fund. Um, and that's really it on the STP side. It's pretty much kind of business as usual. I'd be happy to answer any questions on that as well. Okay, see none, continue on. All right. Um, the next budget is the one I just mentioned uh, and all three of those, the Utility Capital Projects Fund. So you can find this one on page 98. 
And these are large multi-year capital projects typically. Um, this fund is used to account for major water, sewer, and sewage treatment plant capital projects. Some projects are multi-year projects and others can carry over from one year to the next depending on workload and staff availability. The proposed 2021 and 22 budgets for this fund are $3,383,500 and $5,306,500 respectively. For comparison, the 2020 budget is $3,774,500. Uh, the 21, 2021 and 2022 capital projects in water are MO Admin Office Building, um, Water Tank 12, Water System Extension to Airport, AMI Advanced Metering, City Hall Solar, that's retainage, Piping Addition, um, Terraview Drive, that's in conjunction with the Roundabout Project. Um, and those, all these projects that I'm mentioning are all part of the city's approved CIP program. The capital projects in sewer are m &O facility grading and sanitary sewer extension to airport. Um, and again, that's uh, retainage because that project completed earlier this year. So we got the sewer gravity sewer line extended all the way out to the vicinity of the new terminal. The wastewater treatment plant projects are UV disinfection, a small amount left on that. Uh, thickened waste pump, uh, waste, WAS is waste activated sludge, thickened waste activated sludge, pump replacement, dissolved air flotation, flotation thickener replacement, and replacing the belt filter press. And the thickened um, WAS pump replacement and the dissolved air flotation thickener replacement are consultant projects, and we're about ready to go out to bid on those. So I expect probably early next year council will see uh, construction contracts for award um, for those projects. So um, this fund and highlighted projects tie into city goals related to dependable infrastructure, community partnerships, uh, namely to continue to champion the, the new airport, you know, and we're looking at getting water out there as well. And uh, specifically with the solar project, community health and sustainability. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on this fund. Uh, Al Sorensen. Hey, Kevin, uh, just a quick couple of questions here in regards to, to us doing things uh, in our city budget out to the airport. Um, because the airport is inside the city limits of Pullman, it appears to me that we have uh, a number of additional expenses that we are uh, taking care of to help the airport. Are we getting any help from our other partners at the airport in regards to the sanitary sewer extension or the water extension or any of that type of thing? Uh, no. Um, and if you'll recall, um, and as far as I know, we haven't asked. Um, the If you'll recall, the sanitary sewer extension, we got, a I think, a $1.6 million grant that uh, Senator Schessler helped with. So, the city's portion of that, I think, was six hundred thousand, maybe somewhere in that range. Um, but the majority of that project was was grant related. Um, and yeah. I, I think it, I think in thinking about it, you know, kind of philosophically, most of what the utilities will do once they get out there, the water and sewer, is heat help with economic development around the airport, and Pullman, you know, will stand to benefit the most from that. Yeah, I, I understand that, but uh, uh, and I and I'm not bagging on any of our partners, Glenn. Don't don't, don't think I'm doing that. I'm just uh, I want to make sure you know this is a regional airport with all entities involved, and I just want to make sure that if uh, if there's anything that we can do to get a little help with some of this stuff, I understand at the end of the day, uh, some of this will benefit uh, possibly development at the airport, but um, you know, it's worth asking, uh, you know, if we haven't asked, uh, then I think maybe we should be a little bit, uh, if we can save a hundred thousand here and a hundred thousand there and get some partners to chip in, uh, you know, that leaves us with money to do things in other places. So. And a reminder, half the partners are in Idaho and, 
Yeah. Yeah, but they're they're uh, I understand that they're partnering with something in Washington. So if they can partner at the airport, they could partner with us on some of this probably too. Um, to be determined. Okay. Any anyone else on the thing? Okay. Then uh, continue on, Kevin. Got stormwater. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, stormwater fund budget starts on page 100. Um, the budget breakdown is shown on page 101. This fund is utilized for implementation of the city stormwater management program associated with our NPDES phase two municipal stormwater permit. The proposed 21 and 22 budgets for stormwater fund are $2,096,246 and $2,644,170 respectively. For comparison, the 2020 budget is $2,280,671. Major changes in the 2021-2022 budgets include program salary step increases, continued contribution to Eastern Washington effectiveness studies, additional consultant assistance supporting development of a flood fighting plan. That's something staff has been working on. Uh, major capital projects include a new decamp facility and Park Street flood improvements. Both of these projects are grant dependent. Other capital projects include miscellaneous storm line replacement in 2021 and 2022. Minor equipment includes new and replacement trash pumps for flood mitigation and excavation dewatering. A thermal imaging camera uh, for $1,750 for investigating potential sanitary sewer cross connections and the storm drain system. Um, city goals applicable to this budget are dependable infrastructure and economic development, specifically as it relates to revitalizing Pullman's waterways. And I'd be happy to take any questions on the stormwater budget at this time. Okay, Al Sorensen. Kevin, just a quick question for you in regards to the uh, performance measurements here and leaf cleanup. Can you, can you just give me an idea of out of the budget here? What does that cost for us to go around and pick up the leaves around Pullman? Art, if you're available, um, this might be a good time for you to chime in <laughs> since you probably have a number quicker than I will. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, good to see you guys. I knew the question would come from Al. So, um, to be honest with you, Al, I'd have to probably look into that a little closer before I could really accurate answer um, we just don't break it down like that so I could probably look at the work orders and, and give you some number um, maybe send it to you by email and the rest of the council would probably be how I'd like to proceed with that just so I'm accurate yeah I just I, I think our residents need to know that you know it's a great service that we provide <clears throat> picking up the leaves around town uh, but they need to know that there's some expense associated with that. And uh, I think that would be a really nice thing for, at least for me to know uh, whether anybody else wants to know it or not, but whatever. So yeah, absolutely. I and I'd be happy that. to get that for you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Back to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you. So the next fund um, is a transit fund. Um, and hopefully I don't butcher this too bad. Wayne can correct anything that I get wrong. Um, but before getting into the transit fund, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the incredible work that Wayne Thompson and his team have done uh, dealing with COVID. Um, there's no other public works division that has been impacted so much. They've been on the front lines pretty much every day and have performed amazingly well. I couldn't be prouder of them. Transit is a recipient of CARES dollars through the Federal Transit Administration, which has been a big help. Uh, Wayne and his staff have continuously looked for ways to enhance the health and safety of, of his staff and, and transit's customers. Plexiglass barriers have been installed on buses to separate the driver from the passengers. We are currently working to modify the buses to have rear opening doors, again, to further help with driver, passenger, you know, keeping the distance. Um, we used FDA CARES funds to purchase two surplus sound transit buses um, for like a dollar, um, which helped us offset the limited ridership we currently have with COVID distancing. And once the pandemic is over, we'll surplus uh, two other buses that aren't in as good shape as the two transit, transit buses that we just purchased. 
Uh, transit staff have also implemented nimble route changes and enhanced customer service, including a very high level of cleaning um, of the, especially of the interior of both the buses and the vans. So just an amazing uh, job, well done for transit. Um, the transit budget begins on page 103. Uh, the breakdown is shown on page 104. This fund supports the city's transit system and service includes both fixed routes and dial ride the proposed 2021 and 22 budgets for this fund are $7,114,733 and $5,713,446 respectively. For comparison, the 2020 budget is $5,446,738. A big reason for major year-to-year -year changes in this fund is related to capital. It's a recurring theme with all of our budgets. Um, in 2021, we are slated to receive two new fully electric buses, and that's why um, 2021's budget is uh, a fair bit higher than, than 2022. While in 2022, we don't expect any buses. So um, that's the main difference between the two years. In 2020, uh, just one, uh, I'm sorry, forget that. Um, operational costs in 2021 and 2022 are projected to be similar um, to 2020, so it's really just capital again. Other changes include program salary step increases. Uh, goals this budget addresses include multimodal transportation, community health via electric buses and associated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, promoting services for people with disabilities, and recent positive press related to our new water conservation bus wrap related to the goal of uh, sustainability. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and Wayne Thompson is also available. Questions or comments? Okay, seeing none. Wayne's been giving some really good updates to the council as we've had different kind of grant requests and he's just done a great job. So Wayne, I just want to thank you again. All right, thank you. Okay, the next fund, equipment rental. Uh, ERD, and that budget begins on page 104 with the detailed breakdown on 105. ERD supports the city's fleet of vehicles. Revenue comes from the user departments via interfund rates. The proposed 2021 and 2022 budgets for this fund are $4,578,048 and $2,360,901 respectively. For comparison purposes, the 2020 budget is $3,164,191. Capital in 2021 is up as some 2020 capital is being deferred to 2021, um, partly due to workload issues, um, COVID, and we spent a fair bit of time in 2019 and 2020 working out um, our guidance for how we were gonna deal with new vehicle purchases um, with respect to the city's or the state's uh, alternative energy requirements. And so every time we purchase a new vehicle, we have to evaluate hybrids, diesel, gas, uh, electric, um, all of that stuff to see what the best value is for the city and also to comply with the state's uh, regulations. So capital is the main reason 2021 is up. Uh, there'll be just be a lot more vehicle purchases in that year. Um, changes include program salary step increases. We are also budgeting for backup cameras on snow and ice control trucks to mitigate um, frequent backing maneuvers and to help minimize accidents, especially once we get deep into snow and ice, you know, that backing maneuver in a, a snow plow can be a little tricky. And so providing backup cameras, we think will be a real, um, a real good tool for the uh, drivers um, and should cut down on accidents, I would expect. Um, also included in the budget is a crossbeam adapter for our wireless lift system that makes removing rear suspensions on buses easier. There's also a contribution to new GIS-based computer management system that I talked about earlier. And the main goal supported by ERD's budget is dependable infrastructure. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And Art's also available here. Questions or comments? Backup camera cameras are great as long as you keep them clean. <laughs> especially with the snow and everything else. So, yeah, right. It might be difficult or 
nice challenge on a snowplow. Any other comments or questions? Okay. We can move to bond funds next. Uh, Mayor? Yeah. Um, Art. Kevin, uh, I have the number for Al for 2019 for leaf uh, pickup costs. It's $76,781.78. And that um, is $49,000 worth of equipment and about 28000 labor. Because you're going over a period of four weeks. You're I using, appreciate that. Yeah, you're using several, yeah, now. several dump trucks. You're using a sweeper. You're using mm -hmm. a couple of other pieces of equipment, too, on that. Yeah, and the loaders too, Mayor. Um, so for for um, equipment, it was forty nine thousand twenty eight dollars, and for labor, it was twenty seven thousand seven hundred and fifty three. Can't read my writing, but I think it's eighteen cents. So it comes up to a total of seventy six thousand seven hundred and eighty one dollars and seventy eight cents. Thank you, Art. Appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for getting back to us on that. Thank you. Okay, with that, we go to bond fund. Um, these next two should be fairly quick. Um, the first one is the, and turn to page 92 is where you'll find this, um, is the water and sewer revenue bond fund. Um, the, 21, the 2021 and 2022 budgets for this fund include proposed expenditures related to principal and interest payments to service two revenue bonds. Bond proceeds were used to construct the SR270 sanitary sewer project and the UV disinfection project at the wastewater treatment plant. The 2021 and 2022 budgets are $841,455 and $841,454 respectively. So it's basically just paying the bonds back um, is what this fund is there for. Any questions on this one? Okay. Um, the next fund and last fund for, for public works, and I think for tonight for the budgets is the um, 2018 bond fund. So that project starts on, or that fund starts on page 93. The 21 22 budget for this fund includes proposed expenditures related to principal and interest to service two bonds approved by Pullman voters in 2018 as well as completion of various remaining bond projects. Prop one projects budgeted for in 2021 20, and 22 include a new city hall that would be retainage payment, which would likely occur early next year. Loss in gardens, um, garden house construction. So th that was talked about um, last week, I believe. Um, and we're getting ready to go out to bid on that um, in December with a bid opening in January. Um, so that one is is ready for construction. And then um, Mike Urban is going to be working on the land for Fire Station 3. So we'll be looking at researching sites in 2021 with possibly property purchase in 2022. That's what we're anticipating in the budget. Um, Prop 2 projects budgeted for in 21 and 22 include the Canyon View Path, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, Rini restroom improvements. Um, we did the liner project at Rini uh, this year, and we're going to do the re we're finishing up the design on the restrooms um, and should hopefully be out to bid here before the end of the year on restroom improvements to Rini Park. Um, we'll have retainage uh, for the playfields upgrades um, that we're currently doing now with the fencing and backstops. Um, that will be next year. Krugel Park shelter. Emerald Point and Mary's Park improvements are all budgeted for in the next two years. Um, and the bond projects support the city's goal of livability. Um, the completed projects that we've done include New, new City Hall, we're, we're on in the P new Parks and Rec Center relocation. We're uh, kind of on the home stretch of that down to the punch list. Uh, the portable stage has been purchased. Um, Sunnyside Park ADA path has been completed. Atani Linear Park paving is done. The pool liner is done, which I mentioned, and the play food play field improvements will be done um, here before the end of the month or early December. The proposed 2021 expenditure budget is $3,513,343. And the proposed 2022 expenditure budget is 
$509,343. And be happy to answer any questions about the bond fund. Any questions? Okay, with that, Kevin, we thank you for a fantastic job covering a huge budget you have to deal with every single day. So thank you again for that. We then move on in our agenda tonight. Mayor, Mayor, yeah. yes. I, I got a couple closing items. Okay. Just real quick, I apologize. No problem. So uh, council next week, I, I do have an agenda item um, for time for the council to discuss and deliberate and provide me with some extra guidance so I can bring forward a um, final budget document. So as I've been listening these uh, last two um, workshops for during these presentations, I've picked up some things uh, budget related that uh, council is interested in that I'm going to bring back and report on. I've also picked up on some items that are certainly outside of the budget but have implications, but I'll be bringing back on another agenda item, things like the impact fees discussion, the court study, um, and uh, council goals that we've already discussed. But the things uh, certainly budget related that I've picked up and after I, I've listed these, if I've missed something, would somebody please let me know so I can um, get staff to help me out. But uh, I definitely want to bring back a discussion on the vacant positions in the police department. The 120 Civic Improvement Fund uh, with respect to the items in the contract. Uh, the progress of the city administrator recruitment as far as the dollars attributed to that. Uh, the GIS hiring process to get that position filled. Um, hearing some of the things this week and last week, I'm going to already have an appointment scheduled with uh, Dee and Haley to put together a matrix of all the position changes that you've been presented in the budget so you can look at it all in one place. So that'll be part of our next week too. Um, a professional marketing materials for business recovery, retention and expansion through economic development. And uh, did I miss anything specifically I could start prepping for? Okay, well with that, I'll put the agenda on there and I, I think, I just, that's all good stuff, Mike. I'm, I'm in on all that. Okay. Okay. Then I'll bring these things back for your discussion and uh, be prepared for that. Thank you, council. And thank you, mayor. All right. So next we have the consent agenda. These are, yes, Nathan, I see your hand up before we hit consent. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it, Glenn. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, express uh, going through this budget. Um, I know a lot of us have been through many of these. I was really struck at how the departments, uh, everybody came together. There were a lot of things that they needed to pivot on and, and cuts they needed to make. And, you know, they, they totally, it, it, it was really astounding to look through it. Uh, and I just wanted to recognize that because this was really impressive. The different management, the new positions, it really seemed uh, like we're coming out of, we're going to come out of COVID even stronger than when we uh, went in. So I just wanted to recognize that. Thank you for saying that, Nathan. Appreciate it. Okay, now move to the consent agenda. These items are considered routine in nature. Uh, do I hear a motion to read by title only? So moved. Are you second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? With that, we have Laura McAloon with the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. Your consent agenda consists of a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the regular meeting of November 2nd, 2020 and approve them as submitted. A motion to approve disbursements for account accounts payable checks numbered 101417 through 101472, totaling $532,712.36. A motion to approve disbursements for accounts payable electronic funds transfer, numbered 1025202, totaling $62,115.02. A motion to ratify change order number one to the airport utility extension sanitary sewer project contract. A motion to approve Pullman Police Officers Guild Support Services Employees 2021 labor contract. And a motion to approve Pullman Police Officers Guild Uniformed Employees. 2021 labor contract. Is there any item the council would like out for discussion? 
Seeing none, the consent agenda consists of items one through six. Do I hear a motion to approve? Approve. Second. Move and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, we go to the uh, regular agenda. There is nothing on that line. Uh, we've also checked uh, Rob Baker. Is there anyone on the line for public comment? We know, I know we have two items for under new business tonight. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. With that uh, first item on new business, uh, Nathan Waller talking about a grant uh, tying with WSU. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I believe everybody, or uh, I, I believe the council has received and the mayor has received letter from um, Dr. Brian Kraft at uh, WSU. Um, him, myself, Jennifer Hackman, several other people uh, uh, in the community at WSU and entrepreneurs um, are looking to do um, uh, an EDA grant uh, and explore technology, entrepreneurship, and infrastructure um, in downtown and surrounding areas uh, with WSU and the Port of Whitman. And I just wanted to bring it up in new business and would hope that um, the council that we could uh, that we can pursue this uh, as a city. There isn't much that we would need to do except um, agree to uh, collaborate with WSU. It's a part of the EDA grant um, request to have a collaborator, a uh, community collaborator. Uh, and that grant would be due December 3rd. So I just wanted to reiterate what Brian had already sent. Um, so that was new business. I can answer some questions. Jennifer can, I'm sure as well. And it would it would impact a little bit of Jennifer's time and Jennifer, if you want to make a comment about what impact it you see that would happen uh, on your budget, since you also have a pretty good <laughs> working uh, assignments that we've uh, come up with tonight too. So yeah, thank you, Mayor, and um, and I am looking for direction. I think more than anything else, um, this is an EDA Sprint Challenge. It kind of came up a few weeks back and I joined a call that Brian uh, Kraft called um, really to discuss it. But the idea is um, to engage in a process um, whereby the city would take the lead role as the applicant for this EDA Sprint grant. And, um, and I believe that the elements primarily are training and education and support. Um, as well as looking at building local investment networks. This is all to support our entrepreneurial ecosystem coming out of um, centers of excellence at WSU. And, um, and furthermore, to, um, to look at a place-based focus, um, which is kind of where the port would come in. So looking at a couple locations um, close to or in downtown, which in my view, if we could succeed in that, would bring some of that activity and some of those entrepreneurs to closer to the downtown area as workers. Um, it is a bit of a long shot. I am not gonna you know, mince words on that, um, but I see this effort coming together with the port and WSU as, as the start of um, future opportunities and relationship. But yeah, um, working on this grant and providing kind of the, you know, just the writing um, portions, which I believe that others have already signed up for primarily, but, but yeah, this would impact me. It would, it would be as much as uh, two or three days worth of work. That's just a, an estimate there. Because a lot of people don't understand how much is involved in writing grants and then also following up if you get the grant with all the reporting that's required with it. Nathan, back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jennifer, I appreciate you delving into a lot of that. Um, you know, it, this is, there are, as Jennifer said, several uh, different individuals taking on um, different parts of the grant and our focus uh, at the city. And Jennifer, you can let me know you spoke about it a little bit is, is the place-based focus. Jennifer and I would be collaborating on the place-based focus coming up with some wording on that. Um, and just to uh, um, 
reiterate um, something that, that I really see this as, and I ex explained this to Jennifer and the, the group uh, and Brian Kraft, is it's a real investment in the future of, of Pullman and WSU collaboration with the port and also an investment post pandemic. I know right now we are set on retaining and supporting our uh, local businesses right now, but also looking forward. And I know there was a discussion several weeks ago, looking forward past pandemic, what do we do? How do we bring people forward and you know back into Pullman? Um, and I really see this as an investment, but then again, you know, that's just me. I get excited about these things. So I'll be quiet. And if there's any questions. Questions from the council on this. Our direction. Al, we'll go to you. Uh, just a comment here. I, I know a little bit about this and, and haven't been able to speak with uh, the guy running the thing yet, but um, I think we need to be a little bit concerned about what we're talking about. Uh, in downtown, you know, uh, are we talking about turning downtown into a retail business area or are we talking about it being businesses? If we're talking about something that's going to bring people into downtown, is a business incubator really something we want in downtown? I think there's an awful lot of things we've got to think about and be very careful about what what's happening here. I, I'm good with looking at things, but what is our plan downtown? Okay. Is it, to, is it to have businesses that other people can go visit or is it places that just a couple of people go work at? Um, are we going to revitalize downtown to where there's a lot of activity and things going on, or are we going to do it to where there's just a few people downtown? Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant and cautious about what the end result of this will be if it's something that's happening in downtown. I have no problem with incubators and in you know, other places, but I think we have to be really careful about well, what we're talking about trying to do downtown. Um, let me go to other council members before I go back to Nathan. Uh, and then I'll go to Eileen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to mention that I've heard about this from two people, Brian Kraft himself and my husband, who's a vice provost at WSU, who works with Brian regularly. And when I spoke with Craig about the project, he was very encouraging. I, I understand um, Al's point about retail, but I do think we we, in addition to that, not instead of it, but in, in addition, we do need to step back and look at how we're going to do business moving forward. And I think that our being approached by WSU, not the other way around is, is uh, enormous. And I think that any collaboration we can do just to, just to do some research and uh, have round tables and work sessions or what have you, um, it, it can only be beneficial in my opinion and helping us move forward because the way we did business even five or 10 years ago has changed and it's going to continue to do so. Thank you. Eileen next. Yeah, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Brian Kraft and they, he came up with some pretty intriguing things. Uh, my immediate concern is the fact that the deadline on this grant is coming up very, very fast. And um, if we want to, I know we've had concerns in the past as a council that things just kind of get dropped on us and then, and then the following day the grant is due. So let's let's uh, remind Brian uh, gently or however we want to need to do it that we, we want to see this thing as it comes together. And I don't know if that comes through Jennifer's desk or what, but I definitely want to see this thing as it comes together, What whose commitments are where, and have some time to discuss it as a council and think about it and read the documents thoroughly if there are a big pile of them or whatever it might be. But I'm worried about that short timeline and having to make a decision without having enough input from all of us to uh, to sort out where we wanna go forward with this thing. It is intriguing. Uh, others, uh, Pat Wright. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive. 
um, regardless of whether we are able to make the deadline for this grant. Um, I think people downtown, activities downtown, um, drive retail, drive services, and vice versa. And I think it's important that we consider both ends of the spectrum. But I also think as a council and as a down, uh, downtown Pullman Association, what is it that we want? What is the identity that we want downtown Pullman to be? We already have businesses downtown that are very service oriented, optometrists, um, architects, uh, those kinds of insurance companies, accounting companies, those, I don't see them going away. And so what is it that we do to enhance addition of retail services without having the downtown population? It, it's not going to happen unless we want to pull in after dark kind of scenario. So that's what I would throw out there that I don't think we should discount one over the other. I think we need to examine the roles in both um, fields. So that's my contribution. Okay, back to Nathan. Uh, yeah, I um, absolutely understand the uh, concerns um, from, from councilman, um, Sorensen and also Eileen, um, you know, I can, uh, both Jennifer and I will have a meeting this Friday with Brian Kraft. Either way, you know, the council decides whether we pursue it um, or not um, and can express those uh, concerns. And um, I think it should be mentioned, it's not just downtown, you know, the, they are looking at surrounding areas as well. Um, and so the downtown portion was really because um, Brian Kraft and WSU recognized how important downtown is to the council and how important it is to have a vibrant, well, sorry, Eileen, I know you don't like a dynamic downtown. Um, I don't know if that's better, but I, that's why uh, when discussing this with Brian and I said, you know, downtown is really important to the council. Um, that's why he said, well, I, uh, you know, it would also be an in investment in infrastructure, entrepreneurship, uh, tech transfer type of, uh, situation. So, but he said also the surrounding areas, because I don't think, you know, it's not WSU's idea to crowd out downtown or to eliminate retail or anything along those lines. I think it was put pretty, uh, pretty well. I, can't remember if it was Jen and I who were talking, but you know, with the city hall not being downtown anymore, that takes out a certain population that were going to restaurants. I remember seeing several um, city folk, you know, city of Pullman employees at restaurants downtown, and so you have kind of a vacuum now, where as Pat uh, Council Member Wright uh, expressed, you have you have a vacuum of individuals that are downtown and creating, even if it's a small um, uh, incubator uh, downtown or on the outskirts of downtown helps to bring more people there where they would walk to a restaurant so that they could get back to, you know, an incubator or they could get back to work. So I think it's really, it has this uh, uh, collective uh, increase, I believe, in the population downtown and for business. But I, you know, will go with what the council feels. I, I feel we can pursue this EDA uh, grant. And even given the short amount of time, there's several people working on it. And there's additional ideas of grants moving forward as well. So. So I think with a short timeline, we need to at least get a uh, thumbs up that Jen should continue to work on this. Uh, again, it's a long shot, but there's such a short deadline. And if you have another meeting, they need to know pretty well tonight whether the council uh, would stand behind it. Uh, as far as economic impact, as far as how much the city has to pay for it, it'll be primarily your time. And I think you told me, Jen, earlier that 
Brian would be writing this or they had other people that would be writing the grant, you had to put just a small segment in. Right. I have a small segment and um, I would say about six other people have signed on to write elements of it. Um, and Brian is overseeing that. And I'm giving that estimate as the worst case scenario, just to, just to be, can um, just to be candid. So um, I don't, I don't think it would um, likely take that long, but I just like to hedge my bets. Okay. And I will also be helping on that portion with Jennifer. We were both tasked for that place-based, um, but I'm going to rely mostly on Jennifer's expertise. So. But again, with that December 3rd deadline, uh, we need to know tonight. Eileen, back to you. Yeah, like I say, I'm in favor of going forward with this, but did I hear somebody say that W or that uh, City of Pullman would be the primary applicant? That's correct, Eileen. Um, WSU does was. That, does, does that not make us then responsible for the performance metrics that it will be in this grant? Um, it, 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 it would it would, depending on the performance metrics there, that there are. And I have to say, I have not spent a ton of time investigating at this point um, what those are, um, just because um, I didn't have direction and I, I wanted to wait to, to get the council's input before doing that. WSU was going to apply for this grant and then discovered that WSU in another area was already planning to. So that meant that they, in Pullman, they couldn't. So they are really just looking for the city to, um, you know, be the named applicant. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, like I, said, I love the idea. I'm just making sure we get full disclosure going here. And sure. So we can make, we can make good decisions. I think this certainly speaks to what we're looking for in terms of steps to recovery. Okay. Um, it's kind of an opportunity for us to put our money where our mouth is. So I would be in favor of it. So uh, uh, I'm looking for a, you would take a vote tonight uh, to rather to pursue it. So at least we can at least get some direction. Uh, again, it's a, uh, December 3rd deadline. I've heard generally the majority of you say go ahead, but I just want to make sure we as well. Okay. Mayor, do we have to take a vote or is this just an advisory? I think we've got an advisory. We've got, I've got, I've, I'm seeing the majority say go ahead. So that, if that works for the council, then yes. And Eileen, I'll make sure that we have updates regarding it. Um, you know, yeah, on if this thing is in process, somebody should be able to get a draft or get the bare form in front of us, you know, by COB tomorrow. Uh, yeah. We'll meet, we meet Friday, but um, I will let Brian. This meeting. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Then I've the majority there. So you got direction on that. So now with the second item of new business tonight is regarding an email that we were uh, got from um, Art Swanick from the Whitman County. Uh, who's chair of the Whitman County Commissioners. And uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to Mike. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good evening again, Council. So as the Mayor mentioned, late Friday, Commissioner Swanick sent an email to the Mayor and um, it was forwarded to me over the weekend and I sent it to you on Monday. So for the benefit of those watching and then just kind of as a recap to what has happened here, is we're talking about what was uh, formerly House Bill 1406 when uh, Commissioner Swanick came to us last October and talked about partnering with the city to get a affordable housing tax credit that if we were to partner, we could maximize the opportunity. And at that time, council was agreeable to um, working with the county on this and we would uh, ask for the credit to sit and accumulate over a period of years until there was a project big enough to um, go forward with. Well, fast forward to this summer and specifically the Malden Pine City fire, how uh, that just wiped out that community. And what uh, Commissioner Swanick learned on um, this particular item is that 1406 can be used 
for some rent assistance um, because our partnership in our county is below 400,000. So before he went and tapped those dollars, he definitely wanted to come back to get council and the mayor's feeling on, is that an acceptable use right now, even though it was not what was presented a year ago, to come in and um, help this that community with some rent assistance because a lot of them are, you saw the damage up there. Many of them are living in um, RVs during the snow coming through. So um, I'm just putting this out there for, I can answer some questions about 1406. And I remember that meeting very well because that's the meeting I refer to as when I needed to go to the eye doctor and um, let council discuss um, if this is an acceptable use for the dollars so the mayor can get back to Commissioner Swanick in a timely manner. And again, he's working through Community Action Center too on this. Right. Right. Jeff so, Kaya. Uh, see your hand up. Sorry. I, oh, sure. Thank you. Um, Mike, can you tell us, and, and maybe it was in the email, I missed it. What, uh, how, what's, how, many, how much is in the fund? And are we, how much of that would, would be allocated toward the rental, the rent assistance? That was not included in this email. Um, he, it doesn't look like there's a spending plan in here other than he goes on to say at the end of it um, that he would simply ask uh, yourself, the mayor and the Pullman city council, if they'd be okay with Whitman County via the community action center using House Bill 1406 funds to help the Malden Pine City fire victims who qualify to receive it. I expect the use would be until the end of 2021. So if that's, right. I okay. can I can definitely follow up with the commissioner on Thursday when they return to business, if that's a key point. Okay, I was just curious about that. Thank you. That's and again, it was trying to put funds aside to try and build up. So when there was a ba major project, and so he's using those funds now to try and help Molden and, and Pine City. So that's, but he, he wanted by me and I just want to make sure that we have it with you. Okay, Laura, please. I, I just wanted to point out, I think I just scrolled through the RCW. I think what would be required would be an interlocal agreement between the jurisdictions to allow Pullman's funds, because they are Pullman tax funds after the, after the way that you designated them, to allow them to be used by Malden, unless mm -hmm. it would be for a project here in Pullman. Because we've been, we've had need for uh, low income housing and uh, I know Community Action Center has been doing those kind of projects and we have the new Riverview uh, apartment complex that's been built. So right, so for, for projects here in Pullman, they can be spent if you were to use it, but to be able to use it in Malden or to have Malden use it, um, those Pullman tax funds, we just need an interlocal agreement with Malden, just based on the quick research I just did. I, I think it would have to be documented out that way because it is a tax levied on Pullman residents or allocated to Pullman residents. So Laura, if we had chosen to use those funds for a property out in the county, for example, like outside of the Pullman city limits, would we still have had to do that? With well, it's really just pooling the revenue that, right. that an interlocal would be used. So how you use it is different than allowing another jurisdiction to use it. And I guess that would depend on how Commissioner Swanick was um, envisioning this. Right, I okay. I see Thank a couple you. of things. Number one, I'd like to hear from Jeff Guyette at Community Action Center, whether they have a project that they're envisioning that would be using, that could be used in Pullman. And number two, how much is in that fund? Uh, Mike? Sure. And thank you. Uh, part of the presentation, if you vaguely remember, is that the county can collect their funds for the peripheries, but uh, the cities were also allowed to collect their own as well. But if we went into partnership with the county, then they would collect the funds on our behalf and then it, let it build um, you know, more quickly. However, because we hadn't identified a project yet, certainly we haven't done an interlocal agreement. And I'm glad Laura looked at that too, because I went back and just took a quick peek. And um, I'm only the accountant, but I agree with the lawyer on this one. Well, I always know to agree with the accountant, so good. <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, just to resolve this, uh, I'm hearing that we need to find out how much is in the fund. And two, if we've got some projects going here in Pullman that are in the future, not that I know of right now, and I serve on the CAC board, but just in case, I want to make sure we get Jeff Guyatt's uh, input on this. And then we can get back to uh, Art Swanick. Is that all right? So we're not taking action tonight. I'm just bringing it forward. Is that, do I see some head nods on that? Is okay? yeah, yeah, we'll get it back to you by next week on that. So Perfect. All right. Works with for me. Thank with you, no other new business tonight, with the exception of thanking all the veterans, tomorrow is Veterans Day, and want to thank all the veterans for their service to our country. Uh, with that, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Move and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That. Good night. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Stay safe. Good night. Yep.